Yes, we are. Uh, the only apology I think I've received has been from Matthew's indication on that. Be late, yeah. uh, be late that it's come, it's come through. And Gemma, if you have to go, you've. Uh, Gemma, if you have to go, uh, Malisha, I'll take your. If there's any votes. Yeah. Okay. Likewise, Matthew um, is delegated to Pat. Okay, and Matthew is delegated to Pat. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Any declarations of interest? Okay. Uh, chairperson's business, uh, revised agenda. Can I have members' agreement to adopt the revised agenda at page three in the tabled items, which includes an additional oral evidence session from the Department on the spring supplementary estimates, vote on account on the proposed budget bill? Are we agreed? Agreed. I'd uh, like to brief you on an informal meeting I had along with the Deputy Chairperson, and I met with the Minister on the 16th in order to discuss matters relating to the establishment of the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. As members will recall, the Committee asked me to write to the Minister seeking the Committee's involvement in the development of the terms of reference and the decision-making in respect of the membership of the Fiscal Council. The Minister has advised the Executive the Minister has advised us that the Executive is to consider a paper on the Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission on Thursday, and he will let us know if that is not going forward, but I think it probably will be. It is envisaged that the Council will be launched with interim terms of reference for six to nine months. During this initial period, the Council will engage with the Committee, and members will have the opportunity to suggest, to suggest revised terms of reference, with legislation underpinning the independence of the Council being brought forward before the end of the mandate. And it's the Minister's intent, and I think it would be our intent as well, to see this put on a legislative footing. The Fiscal Council will also be established shortly. This will produce a one-off report within nine months on possible alternative taxation measures, which may be actioned by an incoming executive. Subject to executive approval, the minister may take a related written well may make a related written statement soon. Any members have any comments? Okay. I think the actions we'll do when we get the more details and it goes in front of the paper, uh, we will then uh, reconsider this as an item for business. Uh, later on, once we have actually seen the paper and the minister has uh, published his, uh, his written statement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item, carryover of unspent resources. Recent press reports indicate that following a COVID-19 financial uh, reconciliation process in England, further Barnet consequentials of £300 million have been made to Northern Ireland. HM Treasury has reportedly agreed to allow these sums to be carried over into 21-22. As you can imagine, this is welcome news. Members may also wish to ask officials during the sessions today uh, what the consequences of this will be for COVID spending and indeed for some of the other commitments that were expected under a new decade new approach. Uh, I also, you also notice in correspondence from the Minister at page 5 on tabled items and matters of response to the Committee uh, on the Victims' Pension. It is also understood that the Department has only just received figures in respect of the likely cost of the Victims' Pension Scheme. These are reportedly much higher than expected. Uh, members may also wish to ask officials during our second oral briefing today about the likely liability associated with the victims' pension scheme. Members, are we happy and content to note this correspondence and ask the officials when we go through? Chair, yeah, go ahead. you mentioned figures. Do we know what those figures are? No, not yet. And that's why I think we get the opportunity to ask the officials when they're here. Um, I mean, we've heard quite a few figures bandied around: 24 million, 28 million, total liabilities, whatever. Yeah. So it would be useful, um, and I understand uh, there is a figure that has been discussed, and I think uh, it should be useful if we, as the committee, were aware of what that figure was. Okay. Our draft minutes of the proceedings. Our draft minutes of the meeting on the 10th of February, at page seven. Members, are we content? Accurate record of proceedings, agreed, and we're happy to publish them on the website. There are no matters arising, and if I can ask Stuart and Janice to come in. Okay, team. This is uh, the Department of Finance's 21-22 draft budget. Department of the Finance allocation. I remember. I might remember the session has been recorded in Hansard. I advise that the following papers are relevant to the agenda. Clark's cover note at page 18, Department of Finance paper at page 21, 
the January 21 Investing Activity Assembly Report at page 24, and feedback from other committees, which is at page 27 and page 41. Stuart Orr is at Janice, who is leading off with us. Who is speaking first? I think Stuart is uh, mute. Stuart, are you muted? Janice, are you muted? Mutual muting. Mm. Hold on. They not be hearing us. Eh? Neither are. Hold on. Sorry, assembly broadcasting or typing. So that's oh, what right. they're going to tell me. Um. Sure, Janice, wave if either of you can hear me. Uh, well, yay, Janice. Yeah, we can't hear you at the moment, so we're trying to find out if the problem is from this end or not. Apparently, it's their end, and they may wish to um, try their AV settings at their end. So we, we think the problem's at your end, not ours. Okay, we've been told the problem is at your end, and it's to you check your AV settings. To advise members, we do do trial runs with, uh, with officials, so oh, we do. <laughs> Let's give it a few minutes to see if we can sort it out. Oh, no, it's their end, we're being told. Mm. Is there any way they could ring in? Uh, do, do you want to try and log off and log back on again? No, nope, can't hear anything. No, here nope, we go. That's what we're going to do. Sorry, yep, members, okay. just stand by. Are the other officials available yet? They're not on yet. Not on yet. In problem. For once, we're all we're all on. Let's see. Okay, can you hear us, Stuart? No, we can't hear you. Okay, let's, uh, with the committee's approval, we'll give it another five minutes of technical trying to work it out. And then if that's not suitable, can we send the suggested questions to the, uh, and any additional questions members might wish to ask, and we send them to them for uh, response? Because otherwise, it's, we're just gonna spend most of the day chasing. Yes, Chairperson, I think also uh, this is an opportune moment. My service pro has crashed, so I'm All going right. to uh, reboot that. I'll just have to switch it back off and on again. Should we not do correspondence or something while we're waiting? Yeah, I think yeah. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just give them another couple of minutes, Jim, and then. Committee, if we're content while we try and sort out some of these technical problems, can I ask you to look to item 10 on the agenda, which is, I think if we can do the, we can do that and then move on to the correspondence. I think that would be a suitable point to do that. Yep. Can I have your agreement? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, let's move on to item 10 on the agenda. Which is the written briefing on statutory rule 2021-30, the rates making and laying of different rates regulations in Northern Ireland 2020. 
A copy of the above named statutory rule and associated explanatory memorandum is at page 608. The Department has made and laid a statutory will which will remove the statutory conversion factors and which will afford district councils the option of making separate decisions in relation to their domestic and non-domestic rate setting, as opposed to making one decision on how much rates will change across both domestic and non-domestic rates. The Department advises that the decision is in line with recent discussion with NILGA and the switch to optional conversion factors recommended during the 2019 Business Rates Review. The Department advises that councils can continue to use the previous conversion factors should they wish, but the removal of the mandatory requirement will afford them the same flexibility as the Executive currently has when setting the domestic and non-domestic district rate. The rule has been laid in breach of the 21-day Convention, as councils are expected to strike their rates before 1 March 2021. The examiner's statutory rule has accepted this explanation. The Department advises that the rule is subject to negative re resolution assembly procedure. Any members, any comments to make? Jim? Um, I'm, this is a major change in local government funding. I'm a bit disappointed that normally the district rate is struck around the middle of February, where we are at the moment. Uh, I, when I originally saw the press comment about this, thought this was coming in in February 2021. It's actually coming in now, or 2022. It's actually coming in now. Um, I wouldn't have thought, I was a bit disappointed also that the, uh, the examiner statutory rules felt that this was something that could just be excused. Now, uh, whilst I think the principle is a good one, um, and it has been flagged up previously, why are we sitting here when most councils are already 99% done on their rate striking? Why, why are we dealing with this at this very late stage? Any other comments? Have councils operated in anticipation of this, or are they operating on the old system? I think they only have to strike their rates before the 1st of March. They haven't done it yet, so this is intended to be helpful. I think Nilga have asked for this. Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, As the member has indicated, it was something that was mentioned in the re business rates review previously, so they had asked for it. I think recently they've been speaking to the department, according to the department's correspondence, so that's why it's come forward now, and the councils are in the process of uh, making and levying rates as we speak, I think. Well, you know, fair enough, but it's not good governance for such a huge uh -oh. change to be made like this. And I just think we should ask the department why was this not given to us before Christmas? Yeah. So, case I have. so I think there's two parts of this, and I think that's a very valid question, Jim. I think we should be asking that question, but at the same time, uh, are we content to, uh, uh, to say that we have no objection to the rule and the statutory rule to allow the process to continue? Very reluctantly. So. I would, I would, I would, I would take that, and just, just looking as much as I can amongst uh, th through the IT and sort of the limited members here, I think we should write to the department and ask them that specific question. But bearing in mind that the statutory rule is before us, and I accept your reluctance, Jim, but I'll put it to us, to I'll put it to the committee. If the members are content that the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2021-30, the rates making a levelling of differing rates regulations in Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to this rule. Is this agreed? We have no objection to the rule. Say again, Melissa. Sorry, that we have no objection to the rule. No objection to the rule, yeah. Yeah, we have no objection to the rule, yeah. Okay, agreed. Okay, if we move on to item number 11. Do you want to try? No, let's crack through this and then okay, we'll come back to this, because otherwise we will be chasing our tails in this one. Uh, if we move on to item number 11, correspondence, draw members' attention to the index of correspondence at page 617. Uh, Department of Finance expenditure under sole authority of the Budget Act findings. Uh, Jim, last week, um, when you weren't present, but I realised you had a specific issue, issue in black boxes, and I... Uh, Ask for this to be brought forward to this period so we could have a discussion about it. Uh, members' attention is drawn to the departmental response on page 62, 620. This correspondence indicates a fairly long list of measures over a number of years, including changes to AME associated with universal credit, 
and personal independence payments following court judgments and reciprocal arrangements in GB, changes to Dell, including the responsibility for payments to voluntary grammar and grant-maintained integrated schools, switching from DE to the Education Authority, support for Northern Ireland Screen and for HMS Caroline owing to low visitor numbers, welfare reform mitigation, social protection fund and the social investment fund. The Department advises that in future formal letters of approval will issue rather than emails, and officials have offered to come and brief the committee on this issue. Uh, members, do we have any comments? Jim? Yes. Um, obviously, it's been a practice to be very select with it over the years, which I think is quite wrong. Uh, the rule exists for a purpose, and I'm disappointed to see how infrequently it was properly exercised. And the rule is really designed to explain why there isn't legislation in place. Yet, even this year, in the supplementary estimates, mm -hmm. uh, we have no explanation in some cases. For example, with 40.5 million welfare reform, uh, it doesn't explain in the black box why the legislation isn't in place. Um, in infrastructure, page 366 of our pact, again, we have expenditure, no explanation why the legislation isn't in place. Same with the Department of Justice at page 386, and same with um, TEO at page 415. The purpose of the, explana the explanation that's expected is not a statement that it falls under the, direct th under the budget bill, but an explanation as to why there isn't legislation covering it. Mm -hmm. And even after all this probing, the Department is still not the providing question. that in the notes to the estimates. You know, do the Department not get it that they this is a significant issue because we're spending public money without legislative authority, and we need to know why there isn't a legislation to cover these various aspects, and that should be in the notes. And if I take the Minister's intent, and indeed as he, on many occasions and questions we've had both with him in front of the committee, and indeed in the Assembly, he made an indication that he would be looked to resolve this issue, and yeah. this wouldn't be put in front of us again. And in fact, we would have had the detail, and there would, that would have been resolved. Now, it's not a question of uh, this has just happened in the last week. We've been raising this issue since March last year. So, uh, from on behalf of the committee, I think we should we will be writing to the department asking for a detailed explanation of why they haven't proceeded forward with the indications that they they did make on sole authority and what they were and what we were expected to do. And I would like them officials to come here and brief this committee, particularly on this issue, because it has been something that's been raised. And indeed, the minister himself has said that it would be sorted out. And it quite evidently hasn't, if we are content. Well, Chair, could I ask that before next week, the committee, maybe they've already printed or advanced printing arrangements about the supplementary notes, etc., about the notes in the estimates, but they could provide a supplementary slip to go with it mm -hmm. to explain why, in each case, there isn't legislation in place. I think that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable ask. If we are content. Okay, agreed. Agreed. We move on to the next item of correspondence Department of Finance response to committee review of financial process. Uh, members are asked to note a response to the committee regarding the review of financial processes, page 679. The Department confirms that going forward, the new estimate template will be amended to reflect previous commitments in respect of the provision of explanations relating to the use of sole authority. Would anybody like to comment? I have made my comment. <laughs> okay. We we'll agree to that out of a correspondence. Um, next item, Department of Finance, Minister's response, capital expenditure. Members are asked to note a response from the Minister regarding procurement practice and capital projects at page 682. The committee has already agreed to seek a briefing from uh, Construction Employers Federation on the relevant PAC report after Easter. Is the committee content to note, and are we agreed? Noted and agreed. Uh, a 
Note from Jim Shannon Dera on use of judicial reviews. Members are asked to note a memo at page 686 from the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs relating to a large amount of material provided by Jim Shannon MP on Dera's decision to disregard the advice of an independent panel and its consequent use of judicial reviews. As the AERA committee has indicated that it is taking forward issues by Jim Shannon MP, there is no action for the Finance Committee. Are we agreed to that, and are we content to note? Uh, well, yes. I have been copied in that correspondence as well, because a couple of these cases are from South Down. Um, during the three-year suspension, the Department seemed to be very liberal with the use of judicial review at huge cost. Mm -hmm. but they did actually lose some of them, um, and now they are having to carry out a review of all of the single farm payments going back for well over a decade. So it could be a very expensive exercise. But uh, clearly, Mr Shannon and his staff have dug up something quite significant here. And um, there could be a quite an ex expensive uh, bit of funding required by the Department of Agriculture to put people back to where they would have been had they uh, agreed with the panel's decisions. Now, the panels were set up to adjudicate on disputes over single farm payments. Are there no success? And um, the department during the three years just decided to take their views, and that's that's the problem we face at the moment. Uh, should we then be asking a question then for the potential quantum of this? Because of it, if you say it's substantial, it goes back to at least two thousand and eight. Um, these cases where a judicial review now prompt them to do a complete review of single farm payment decisions, and uh, obviously, if if they end up having to pay. Uh, the aggrieved people, well, I have knows what it's going to cost. Hmm. Um, in the view of that, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Jim, for the sort of the information for that. Yes, okay, I think we're content to note, but I think we should communicate with the uh, department and the DALO just to see if they have had any view of the likely potential risk that there is to the budget, because if. If I'm thinking about single farm payments times going back that far, and just doing some, this is a this is a really substantial amount of money. It averages something like two hundred and forty million pounds a year. But of course, the vast majority of farmers got their single farm yeah. payment. These are duplicate fields, uh, multiple ownership, um, not complying with uh, cross compliance regulations. It's quite a complex issue. There's a, there's a second issue that has arisen is that the the uh, compensation that's paid to farmers who've been successful uh, in judicial review is 1% plus CPI. Um, now at the minute, that's minimal. You know, it, it, it's next to nothing because of inflation being so low. And farmers are, the point the farmers are making to me is that at the time that they were turned down for their payment, interest rates were much higher, and they feel that that's not acceptable. So it's a big issue. And the last letter I got from the minister was saying that they're now doing a review of all of these refusals by panels, but it was particularly bad in the three years when there was no devolution, okay. because the panels just were, were being ignored left, right and centre. Can, oh, can I add to that? Obviously, single farm payment is European money, and, it, and if you like, ERA is very much just a channel, uh, or being a policing body, as, if you like, or for the EU at that time. Uh, so there's a further complication here as to who actually is liable. Unsuccessful claims. Uh, is that something that could be recovered against the EU itself, or will that have to come out of the era budget on its own? Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, they were only an accounting body or a conduit to get that money down. So it'll be interesting to see how that actually plays out. So if we can ask a question around who's actually liable. Uh, I'd sort of, I'd, sorry, I'm glad this, you, Jeff. Thank you very much indeed for sort of bringing this up. I think we need to ask a question of the day, look, to ask the department to, through its various links to DERA, to find out what the likely risk is, and is there a substantial risk? Because if we're talking, even even if we were talking about five percent from two thousand and eight, or two to five percent, we're still talking about substantial sums. The two cases I'm doing, one was £29,000 and the other was £30,000, you know, who had been refused. So it tends to be the higher figures that appeal to the panel. Yeah. But, you know, and of course, to a lot of farmers, this is maybe 40 or 50% of their income. Yeah. Okay. 
No, I think it would be useful if we at least we had a view of the overall quantum and the potential impact on the finances. Okay. Moving on to the next item of business. Chairperson of the Economy, Infrastructure and Skills Committee of the Welsh Assembly, Public Procurement Common Framework. Members are asked to note at page 867 that the Chairperson of the Welsh Parliament Committee advises that has received a summary of the framework and has yet to consider the provisional framework. The Finance Committee has agreed to seek oral evidence from CEF and Social Enterprise NI on this subject. Are we content to note? Are we agreed? No. Nope. Noted and agreed. Convener of the Economy, Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Parliament Public Procurement Common Framework. That's on my phone. <laughs> Members are asked to note page 868, the correspondence from the Convener of the Scottish Parliament Committee, indicating that it too has received a summary, but not the provisional framework. Is the committee content to note, and is this agreed? Noted and agreed. Uh, committee for Communicates, uh, com- Communities, uh, Sports Sustainability Fund. Members are asked to note at page 869 a copy of correspondence sent to the Minister of Finance asking for the Sports Sustainability Fund criteria to be widened to include clubs that have previously operated hospitality. Paul, do you want to say something about that? Because I think you raised that issue. Uh, it's a massive issue out there with regards to how businesses, or sorry, how sports clubs are actually going to operate and recuperate, if you like, pardon the pun, uh, after COVID. This is a massive thing. I, I, I believe that a lot of our clubs at a very grassroots level will just disappear. Uh, some of the committees haven't met. Some of, they haven't been able to function as ordinary sports clubs. And sports clubs and organisations have a massive benefit to our society especially our young and even our not-so-young. And those not-so-young people who are still availing of sports activity will just stop. They'll just retire, probably before their time. And there's a lot of youngsters who were availing and enjoying sports up until this uh, emergency who are stuck into other things now, whether it be computer games, whether it be lying about, trying to homeschool, or whatever, and it will be a wrench to get them back. Most of them, most of them will go back, but some of them will not, and that will have a massive impact on society, but also health, health in later years. And there's nobody measuring this. There's nobody measuring this. Now, money is only part of the solution. Throwing money at clubs, the, the well-organised sports clubs will still deal with well, with this and will get that money and use that money to good uh, good good ways and means. But the clubs that aren't so well organised and aren't doing so well and have just been operating to do what they do, which is perform sports, some of those will disappear and go. And there's no point throwing money at them because it would be money going to bad use. So there has to be something more than throw money. Uh, money funding is much welcome and it's only part of the problem but I think there will need to be some sort of support mechanisms other than funding and money to help clubs and encourage people to go back into sports. Okay, thanks. Philip, there's, I've, I've been in correspondence with quite a few sort of GAA clubs and the rest of it and they've got some really uh, big questions about sustainability and also sort of high that some that are operating as clubs and sport clubs as well. Would you like to say anything? I mean, it's, it's, obviously, it's obviously a big issue. Uh, you're right. I mean, uh, I was listening to Paul. I mean, I, I would be contacted by a lot of local GAA clubs who are actually in a, um, a very difficult position because they own their own grounds and they own their own facilities. You know, an awful lot of other uh, clubs and sporting organisations would be uh, renting and using council and other types of facilities, but in, in, in most cases, GA clubs you are own their own facility, so they, they are in a particularly precarious club. I mean, I, I sat on the APG and sport and, and was so you know we wrote to the minister on the issue. So you know it, it's something that uh, w- would need to be resolved. The, the issue of the social clubs and sporting clubs, and hopefully it can be resolved as soon as possible. Would we be content then to ask the Dalo to keep us informed of progress of the discussions between the Minister for Communities and Minister for Finance on this issue? Mm-hmm. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item of correspondence, Committee for Communities, UK Shared Prosperity Fund. 
Members are asked to note at page 874 a copy of correspondence sent to the Minister of Finance seeking an update of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Are we agreed? Noted. Agreed. Uh, the Committee for Justice, the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme. Members are asked to note at page 877 a memo from the Committee for Justice indicating that it has requested a copy of the Executive Office's response to the Committee for Finance aren't we the Troubles uh, Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. And I hope we will get the position to uh, ask officials that when we get the links back up. So I would reserve uh, matters until we have actually had that opportunity for that uh, questioning, if we are content. Agreed. Uh, Carnegie UK Trust Public Sector Reform. Members are asked to consider a request at page 878 from Carnegie UK Trust to brief the committee on their work regarding public sector reform. Uh, do we have any comments? Uh, do members wish to receive an oral briefing from the Carnegie Trust on public sector reform? Yeah. I think Mr. Hall's just saying. Agreed. <laughs> right. Uh, the composite request. Members are asked to consider the composite request at page 879. Since this is provided, responses have been received in allocations and compliance. Transaction types, OECD review and victims' pensions, which was tabled and from DfE on ABBA Driving School and the Presbyterian Mutual Society and will be considered next week. Is the committee content with that, notwithstanding the above composite request, as an accurate record of the committee's information request, and say, are we agreed? Okay. Agreed. And I'll quickly cover the forward work programme before we try and sort of fight through the technology again, if we're content. Uh, the draft forward work programme is page 890. Our member, if members are content to receive a further briefing next week from the Department on the spring supplementary estimates and the proposed budget bill, as well as a further briefing from Assembly Research in addition to the scheduled evidence from the Constructors Employer Federation, are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, members are reminded that at next week's meeting the Committee will be asked whether it is content or not to provide the necessary confirmation to the Speaker in respect to accelerated passage for the budget bill Northern Ireland 2021. And are members content with the forward work programme as amended? Are we agreed? Great. Right. If we go back, that doesn't work. We'll go to raise. Okay. Okay. We'll try again with the Department of Finance. Let's see if we're got any joy. Come in, Stuart. Come in, Janice. Hello. Oh, we're getting somewhere. Oh, yeah. Stuart, can you hear us? Uh, yes, we can just about hear you. Doesn't do well. This is back to you. Sure, let me know if we can hear us. Yes. Okay. Looks very yeah. loud. Can we hear you? Yeah. Sound? Uh, we're having difficulty hearing you, Stuart. Your feedback too. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, Janice. We can hear you. Okay. Don't tell me you're in the same room as Stuart. <laughs> Maybe they should switch one more. Hope you can hear me now. Yeah, we can, Stuart. All right. Really sorry for the communications difficulties and the, all the technical bits and pieces. But if 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 you're if you're if if you're content, please make your opening statement. Uh, if you're content, could you please make your opening statement? Okay, sorry. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, uh, okay, uh, the department, um, I, I get, provided the uh, written draft, so, uh, or written brief, so I'll not go through it verbatim, but I'll, I'll pick out the highlights from this. So, um, the department uh, has been allocated a draft budget for 21-22. And it's it's along the same lines as last year. Um, we were allocated 166.8, and received some additional monies, 1.8 for uh, associated with EU, 1.3 for collaborative procurement. Um, so that brings us actually to a resource total of 170. 
and the, the way it's been sitting at the moment and allocated is sitting on the table that shows the spending areas it's going to. Um, as you may be aware, I'm not sure that the department's budget, most of it is staffing costs and contracts. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, rates, offices, states, large IT contra contracts, uh, those un underpinning the shared service um, that we have, also a number of large I IT um, contracts and LPS operations. Um, the department um, is looking to take forward not only its, its normal business, but some new priorities in 21-22, and that includes the Fiscal Council and Commission. Uh, and we're also looking to help improve and transform procurement and uh, include an updated non-domestic revaluation, bringing that in for three years as opposed to the five years. Um, there's also a number of pressures arising from, in, including the census, which is due to take part or take place next month, uh, rates rebate scheme, which is under pressure, and the replacement of um, aging IT systems, which we have, which is related to both for HR, finance, um, which is provide services right across departments, um, and also then the, as I mentioned, the LPS IT systems, um, and we need to take things forward. On it. So, uh, having said that, then looking at looking at the sort of pressures that we might have within our current budget, we're looking maybe around 16 million worth of pressures. Um, so, and in addition to that, if there was any pay increase on that, then we would have to absorb that. So um, the bottom line is, is on the resource budget that we do have internal pressures. What we're trying to do is look at those pressures, see if we can move them down and look and see if there's any other lower priority areas or other um, areas that where we can make savings to try and live within our budget. Um, and we're on a process at the moment uh, of working with the directors to see how we can um, deliver savings to make sure that we, we do live within our, our budget. And the, the, um, we will be bringing a paper to our minister and agreeing with him um, what he wants to take forward as far as those proposals are concerned. Um, you'll also be aware the department has been doing this year a lot of work on on, on the COVID-19 um, grants, um, and we expect that, although we, we don't know how it's going at the moment, but we expect there will be some activity, obviously, next year going into the next financial year. The minister's already announced a freeze on domestic and non-domestic rates of 150 million, although that doesn't actually uh, score within the department's budget. That's without uh, the budget. Um, but there may be other grants that we have, then no, we wouldn't have those in our budget at the moment, and that would be dependent uh, on further COVID money coming through. Uh, in terms of capital, uh, we have a net capital budget of 45 million. Now, initially when we sent this, we had forecast about 48, but already we're looking at reprofiling of um, various capital projects, and we're, we're pretty confident that we could live within that 45 uh, Million, million net budget um, going forward, and that that would be with sort of uh, delaying certain projects and some projects maybe costing less than we, they initially forecast. Um, so that that's a quick run through of where we see the budget sitting at the moment. Say so we're doing a lot of work on it at the moment and still, and and liaison, need to liaise with the, the minister and forward to see what he is content with producing the savings. Um, so have you taken any questions on that? Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Stuart. Uh, what we might do, just in case the link breaks down again, we've got a series of written questions that we'll we'll send on to you, just in case everything sort of uh, collapses. But I've got a few questions and a few uh, issues I just want to have a, a quick look at. Um, Certainly. The you you say um, the resource budget is 170.4 million. But in your department, yeah. in your paper, you refer to resources budget for staff costs of 172.4 million. So are we looking at 170.4 or 172.4? Uh, no, I think, yeah, sorry, I think the difference is uh, maybe misleading. One, one's a net budget. Uh, so the overall budget, uh, as is shown in the budget document, is a net position. So includes income, et cetera, whereas that that figure for staffing costs is a, a, a gross figure. That's yeah, that's gross. We get a lot of income in for the delivery of, of services to other departments for the shared services. So that's what makes up our net budget of 170. So it'll be made up of a, a gross total and then uh, income on top of that. So that's why that, those two figures 
may look so um, the 107, the, the, the figure for staffing is a gross figure, the actual cost of staff. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's probably a, it's, it's a slightly bigger question, but the Minister has indicated that there is a £300 million allocation which is to be carried over into 21-22. Well, obviously, we haven't any statement provided on this as yet, and this is the information that's come through. Um, can you advise if this ad enhanced carryover will be used in part to cover the lots, lost rates income uh, in 21-22, or have you not got that far yet? Uh, we haven't got that far yet. The, the lost rates in income, I'm not sure with, with, with that score. In the, sorry. Uh, it'll be probably uh, more centrally and with, with from PSD, so I am not sure that, that that has been worked through yet as far as how our budget works. So uh, can't answer that one at the moment. Okay, if you could get, get us a response to that one, please. Um, the, in, the, in the investment activity report for January 2021, refers to significant capital costs for the Orchard House rain, uh, refurbishment of six to eight million, and the James House asset management pro project of ten to twelve million. What are these projects mm -hmm. about, and why are they costing so much? Uh, well, they're they're part of the 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 whole management of the, the um, NICS estate. Um, as you may know, we provide our DOF is responsible really for providing accommodation for the whole of the NICS and back beyond uh, other um, public sector bodies beyond. And we were we recently purchased James House, uh, so it's refurbishing it and putting it into a state where we can get as many people into the building as possible. You know, um, as far as making it value for money. Um, so and Orchard House is, is a similar reconfiguring the building to make the most effective use of the uh, internal layouts uh, and some or, you know they've been older buildings and needed refurbished um, I say James house was recently purchased so that's what those monies are for um, and then they should in the long term provide savings to the department going forward yeah but uh, just um, I'm just uh, sort of the, the minister I think was talking about move towards new methods of working and new distributive hubs, particularly looking at sort of some of the stuff in Ballykelly, looking at some of the offices in Londonderry, looking at some of the um, offices in Enniskillen, Oma and the rest of it. So is that being is that being factored in into your sort of budgetary process for to to develop these hubs? And if we're developing these hubs, why are we spending all this money on these major buildings? Well, it, it, it's, it's a much wider strategy in the sense of these buildings. Um, we'd be looking at having a mixture of these buildings, plus we have a lot of lease buildings that across um, the department and across the state and civil service in general. And that will allow us to get out of a number of leases uh, in which money can be saved. So uh, there's a much longer term strategy looking at all the buildings we have, including the hubs uh, and the buildings that we purchase and own and those that we lease. So the idea will be to, um, in the long term, to get out of some of the leases, and, um, you know, use that money, that the savings, then to, you know, have our place in in the various hubs and also in the buildings we own. So in the longer term, there will be a, a, a saving across the the estate. Okay, All right. Um, and in the draft program for government consultation contains a number of references to the Department of Finance and its role in supporting transformation in education, health and administration in the PSNI, uh, and its involvement in measures to tackle homelessness and to promote economic growth and digital economy. Um, can you advise us in general terms how the Department is to support these activities, and if there is a required financial cover in the draft budget for 21-22 for this work, and why is the Department of Finance doing uh, work that other departments should be doing? Well, I, I would suggest most of those are, are support as far as um, IT systems are concerned, both HR, financial IT systems, as a charge service, but also uh, things like NI, NI Direct contact centre um, that uh, that will enable greater collaboration um, and greater contact with the public. They, um, so it, it's those sort of shared systems. I, I don't have the specific for each one of those, but those are in general that the, you know the Department of Finance would provide a lot of infrastructure for the whole of the NICS, say, uh, finance, HR, uh, and, say, uh, NI Direct and contact centres. Okay. 
It's just previously that um, in previous program for government, the Department of Finance didn't really have much lines in it or say in it. But it just seems to be in this time that you know it talks very much about its role in supporting transformation. If you could drop us a note, was there some more details on how that's been broken down? And if it is for IT support and it is for sort of digital government or if it's for HR services or whatever happens to be, that would be very useful. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Jim. Uh, I'm just teasing out what you built into the budget as far as rates are concerned. Uh, obviously, the decision to basically provide a rate set amnesty for many businesses in 2020-21 was a lifesaver to many of them. Um, what are your assumptions in 2021-22 for that continuation? What are you assuming? Well, uh, to start with, as I say, the Minister has made a announcement of the 150 million um, going forward. Now, I'm not sure there is the assumptions are long term, and I'm not sure we can make any longer term. That 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 is an initial announcement, and we'll be keeping that under review. Obviously, as as we see how the uh, situation develops, um, as to whether people can get back to work and whether businesses can go up and going. So that's that's going to be a, a continuous assessment as far as rates are concerned. Now, um, to, to, to maybe to ask the question another way. If the present level of concessions to hard press businesses continues, how long will that one hundred and fifty million pound last? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't answer, uh, answer that because that will depend on the number of of, of um, if, if you like schemes that are are laid out and with any whether any businesses come back. Um, so I, I, I know the rating, if, if you like, the current sort of support is in around three hundred million. Yeah. So. We were already said we, we we would give another 150 million, um, and that so you, you can make assumptions that it, it could be for six months to start with. But that again would is more a central line as far as PSD is concerned, in, involving the other departments so as well. So uh, we'd need to. I couldn't answer that with any accuracy, but um, so, uh, saying that you know you could make that assumption. Yeah, um, and obviously that's very welcome, but. If the situation doesn't improve as much as we expect, what flexibility is there then to extend that beyond six months? Or would you be expecting funding from outside the department for that? Well, I, I would. I would anticipate that we would be looking for additional funding for that, um, because um, it, this, the sheer scale of, of that, the amount of money required from that, I'm not sure it could be absorbed within the um, Northern Ireland block. So the only certainty we can give for businesses is that there's £150 million which may provide a rates holiday or rates amnesty for about six months. We don't have it tied down to an exact time. I mean, can, can businesses assume they're not paying any rates until September? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think they can make that assumption. and uh, I don't think I'm in a position to, to make that suggestion either. Um, we won't tell anybody. We, we will keep it between ourselves as a uh, secret. No, no. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I still wouldn't want to be saying things that are wrong. I, I, I can only make state the facts that there is 150 set aside. Next well, would it be useful for the department to, to actually specifically tell businesses now before the start of the new financial year where they stand, so that there's clarity? Because um, whilst this is all very welcome, uh, the new initiatives seem to suddenly appear from nowhere, and that's very difficult for businesses to plan long term. You know, can, can we be specific and say, if you're a certain category of business, you will pay no rates until a certain date, or is that asking for too much? Well, I'm, I'm certain that the minister will be looking at that um, and, and has been in contact with, with businesses you know, uh, and representatives, so I, I'm sure there will be some sort of announcement to allow businesses to account for that. Happy. Jim. Yeah, I just want to go back to the question about the Connect Hubs. How much are you uh, planning expenditure-wise in connection to the Connect Hubs in next year's budget? Um, well, that, that's at the moment there, there's not very much in the budget for those next year. I mean, we're looking at um, first of all, much to, that's very early stages. As to we you know we're we're talking to various councils in various areas as to how much it might cost, um, so we don't actually have much in those areas, and it may be that 
part of it is looking at what buildings we have and sharing them or whatever. Um, but at the moment, it's very early stages for the hubs. Oh, sorry, we have a written statement just released this afternoon by the Minister, which says the first Connect Two hubs are expected to open in Bally, Kelly and Downpatrick this year. Planning has started for facilities in Bellamina, Craigavon, Oma and the Antrimutin Abbey area with their opening plan for 2022. And you're telling us there's no financial allocation for those? No, no. What I'm saying is we will, there wasn't any specific allocation for those, but there is an allocation for the, um, the form of property management in there. So we, it, we will be looking at how we can best allocate those resources to make sure that hubs are covered. But have you any idea how much the hubs are going to cost? Uh, I don't. Um, we can have a look at uh, and, and provide you with some information on that. I don't, don't resource, have the information. Is it a resource on... and a capital expenditure? It, it's likely there may be a combination of both. Well, would we not then expect to see that reflected in the figures you're bringing forward to us for next year's budget? Well, as I say, this is still the very early stages, and, and as the draft budget, a lot of these, uh, particularly the hubs, is, is very uh, is ongoing work. So we, we need to look at what the outworkings of those are and factor them into our budget. Thank you. Oh, Paul, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much uh, so far for your presentation. And, and uh, technology uh, can fail you at any stage, so some of these for you uh, in this meeting. But again, it's not great for communicating, believe it or not, for this sort of scrutiny work. Uh, can I ask, how much of your direct budget in the Department of Finance is actually and, and the term was used last week, which I'll use. It's not my own terminology, but it must be economic jargon. Uh, how much of your budget is silted up by old borrowing and interest payments? How much of our budget? I'm not sure any of it is. Right, OK. Um, so, no, we, we, we would get an allocation from the centre, but it, there wouldn't be borrowings and... So, so you, things were done. Yep. So the, the department, the pure department, hasn't had to at some point bid for for uh, something and and receive borrowing money from borrowing at any stage, which then the onus is on your department purely to pay back that borrowing. No, not not at the moment. No, we don't have borrowings from in that respect. No. Right. Okay. Or in any respect, indeed. With, with regards to uh, the work that you guys are doing now on the programme for government, the, the draft programme for government, and I'm, I'm looking at it here, I haven't spent a lot of time, invested a lot of time looking through it as yet, uh, but, but explain to us again, what is, what is the primitive work that you're doing on this, and why, why does it fall to your department as opposed to, let's say, the executive office? Uh, what? What? Why? Sorry, does the program for government work? Yes. Full, full or? Yeah. Why? Why have you budget lines? Sorry, I didn't hear that. It froze there a second. Sorry. Why have we budget links? Yeah. Why have you budget lines on the program for government? Well, well, again, that's I'd say to do it's showing the support that the department uh, provides for other departments. I think in previous, maybe in previous programme for government, that um, it was felt that DOF didn't really get the acknowledgement that we, we do provide a lot of help and, and support to enable other departments to provide their services. Um, and I, th I think that has to be acknowledged, the, the IT, the digital side, et cetera, that we do to help other departments and provide platforms and systems to help them enable them to deliver their services. I suppose this is a recognition that we, we do actually and play a very important part. So so then how does that so th that's actually a, a very good a very good answer there in regards to the support you do give. Uh, and I think we do appreciate that and acknowledge that. What we really yearn for <coughs> joined up executive functioning together to produce a programme for government together. How will this money, this funding, be able to complement that wish? 
going forward? Um, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. How, what do you mean complement? I mean, the, the money <coughs> in the budget is delivering it. Uh, I'm not sure it necessarily complements other money. So, so what? what so, to, to, sorry to explain myself. I suppose what we have is a program for government, but what we still have is a silo mentality within executive departments. So, so how? I suppose what I'm asking is how best can you spend this money? Whilst it is an acknowledgement that you guys are very critical uh, in, in in a practical sense, but how can you use that or utilise that money better to ensure or to even police? May I add? the other departments in, in ensuring that there's a joined upness, one in a practical sense with regard for a program for government, but also in a real tangible sense out there to the public that our departments are working together on a program for government. In, in many cases, the indicators will be shared indicators between a number of departments. I suppose what I'm asking yeah. you, and it's not just for you, uh, it's for all of our departments, is how best this money that you've received, how can that be utilised to ensure a joined upness that we haven't had before? Well, certainly, we, I mean, we work very close with the other departments on how the money's been spent. Now, obviously, the priorities on, on the money and how it's been spent will be, it's actually more, from my point of view, you know, it's the direction from the executive and how the executive works together to decide how the money should be prioritised. Um, so if there are priorities in education and health that you know support needs to go to them, that it's ensured that all the departments are helping to deliver those high priorities. Now, um, we will follow that direction uh, and through our minister decide where, where the money should, should be sent to and, and where our focus should be on. Um, but there's certainly amongst officials, there is, there's very close working relationships on, on trying to deliver programme for government and uh, top priorities. Okay, thank you. That's me. Okay, thanks, Mr. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies, I was uh, late at the start of today's meeting. Um, can I just ask, uh, Stuart, and I'm not sure if this came up um, prior to my arrival, you've allocated $2.3 million for um, as support for Fiscal Council and Fiscal uh, Commission. Um, just wondering what the uh, what, what the bulk of the, is that salaries basically. What else is it going to be spent on? Well, well sorry, um, that, that's not all for Fiscal Commission. Fiscal points. So that also, also includes you know C CPD building, DSO transformation, and PSD baseline. So it's finance, procurement, policy, Fiscal Council, and Fiscal Commission. So there's only a small element of that will be probably for salaries and uh, on the fiscal commission. It doesn't I'll be talking about less than in, in, in terms of salaries and, things like that. Right. and support, obviously, for them because they will need some sort of secretariat. But if it's, it doesn't sound like if it's fiscal council, fiscal commission, and CPD. Yeah. It would just be helpful to understand I need to step out at a quarter past what the balance is in terms of Sorry for five minutes. What, what the co what, how that number was arrived at, as someone who's very supportive of the setting up of both. I go to the toilet. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that's very much under development. I, I don't have the, the actual detail behind that as far as how the Fiscal Commission and Council are impacting, whether it's whether attendance fees or whether you know they're, they're treated like board members or whatever, but they will have some sort of expenses as far as attendance fees and things like that are concerned, and they will also have a sec secretariat behind that. Um, now, I say it's certainly not that 2.3 million, the vast majority is not for fiscal council. Um, I don't have the exact figures as to how much that, and I'm not sure that those exist yet at the moment, the very accurate figures. These are just high level figures that we need to be looking at to, to make assessments as to what we need to factor into our budget. Okay. and then. This may be a stupid question, but just on, on the resource on the resource Dell side, the um, the department has t uh, there's a 1.8 million uh, allocated for EU exit costs. <coughs> um, what is that yeah. mostly? Well, that, that, a lot of that work will be things like uh, DSO um, looking at statute. Um, it'll also be for um, the special projects division in SPAR, looking at how they can facilitate businesses and uh, 
help ease the way for um, EU exit, and the other side is is for NISRA, you know, statistical support for those. Okay, and then and the the the, the one point three million for SCUPB, that's the that's effectively administrative. Co that's the administrative cost. So yes, that, yes, that's funding to, to, to run the north south border. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Okay, Stuart, Janice, thanks very much indeed, but apologies again for the communications link. Uh, no. We've probably got a few written questions we'd probably like to send on to you to have a, to have a look at, but uh, okay. rather than go through and continue with this torturous link, <laughs> I think we can, uh, I think we can yeah. do that as well. But uh, good to talk to both of you again, and I uh, hope Janice doesn't feel too put out by having to be pushed off her working microphone. <laughs> no, I think she's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank talk, you. talk soon. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Bye. And we should be okay for the department. Right, so. let's see. Uh, next item on the agenda, let's, hopefully this is going to work. Uh, department for Finance, Draft Budget Bill 2021, Spring Supplementary Estimates and Vote and Account. And that's Joanne, Jonathan and Rushing. Joanne, please tell us you can hear us. I can hear you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yay! Uh, apologies for the <laughs> timings being slightly awry. We had a bit of a comms failure earlier on, so we're just we're just trying to catch up as well. Uh, the other thing, I, I need to apologise. I need to step out at about a quarter past three for a couple of minutes, and the deputy chair will cover in that uh, particular period of time. But my apologies for that. I'd just like to remind members that this has been recorded for Hansard. Uh, the clerk's uh, revised covering note is on page 31 in tabled, tabled items. Letter from the Minister of Finance on accelerated passage for the budget bill is at page 34 of tabled items. And the department's briefing paper and the copy of the spring supplementary estimate vote on account and proposed budget bill is page 106 of the meeting packs. Joanne, could you care to make your opening statement, please? Thanks. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much for this opportunity to brief the Committee on the first Budget Bill of 2021. Um, as the Committee will be aware, this Budget Bill is comprised of two parts, the Spring Supplementary Estimates for 2021 and the Vote and Account for 2021-22. Spring Supplementary Estimates position is set out in the detailed document which has been provided to the Committee, and this Budget Bill reflects the final approval for the current financial year. This is essential to ensure that departments can spend the funding allocated between the main estimates and the end of the financial year. The vote and account for 2021 is essentially a bridging mechanism which allows departmental expenditure to continue between the start of the financial year in April until such times as budget number two bill or main estimates receive royal assent, which is usually around the start of July. The vote and account does not reflect a set financial position, but is instead based on a percentage of amounts voted for the 2021 year as part of this bill. It's not related to the draft budget announced in January, Instead, the executive's final budget will be reflected in the budget number two bill and associated main estimates. I know that one of the key considerations for this committee is whether to re-accelerate the passage for this bill. And I'd just like to say a few words on why it's so important that this bill receives royal assent for the end of the financial year. Because if it does not, there will be a significant and adverse impact on departmental spending. Until such times as the budget bill receives royal assent, departments are constrained by the spending limits in the budget number three bill, which was passed in November last year. Due to the unprecedented level of funding for COVID-19 support, there's been an increase in the total net cash requirement of 1.27 billion and in the net resource requirement of 2.23 billion for the main estimates provision set out in that budget number three bill. If this bill does not get royal assent for the end of March, departments will not be able to access this additional funding. If a department runs out of cash, it will not be able to pay its staff or suppliers or indeed provide the levels of support needed in the current pandemic. This will also lead to budgetary underspends, which will ultimately result in funding being lost to the Treasury. Emergency measures do exist in a scenario where a department has exhausted its cash limits due to unforeseen circumstances. This takes the form of an advance from consolidated fund for contingencies. However, the amounts that DOF can authorise under these measures is limited to 2% of the total provision for the previous year, which in this case is some $350 million. An added complication is that DOF itself has already had to access this contingency funding this year, and therefore there's only 152 million remaining. Sorry, and that's that's right. Just to go back to that, 
Sir, you've already had to access contingency funds this year? Yes, simply because the amount of grants that have been paid out means that DOF itself has exhausted the cash that was granted in the main estimates. The committee would have been informed, and that is indeed where the assembly. So uh, as a bridging mechanism to get them through until such times as these SSEs are approved, they have had to access the consolidated fund for contingencies. That will obviously be paid back out of the, the voted amount in this bill, should again roll at royal assent in time. But that does mean that we're only able to access a further $152 million for contingencies for the remainder of this financial year. And I'm sure, as the committee will appreciate, with the cash requirement, which has increased by $1.27 billion, $152 million is not going to be very, going very far. Sorry, sir, excuse me. But surely that would have been paid back in and it reset it? It won't reset it for this year. It will, it will be all right next year, but it can't be paid back in until such times as this bill itself receives royal assent. So until this bill receives royal assent, the level that we can access for contingencies is set at $152 million. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and just in summary, I mean, I appreciate that the, the granting accelerated passage is dependent upon the committee having had ample opportunity for scrutiny of the bill. But the SSE has been based on the outworking of the in-year monitoring and numerous COVID exercises this year. I would hope that the ongoing engagement we've had throughout the year would mean that the committee has been able to fully consider this position. However, we're here today and I believe we're also available next week to answer any questions the committee may have. Yep. yep. I'm just happy to take any of those questions now. Okay. Um, just to look at sort of um, the indications of the following the, the COVID financial reconciliation process in England, the further Barnett consequentials have been made. Because obviously we're yes. looking at the figures we were expecting, you know, after the of the of the five billion, we were looking at a figure of about two hundred and forty seven million, but now it's grown up to three hundred million. So that's additional Barnet consequentials have come from the reconciliation in, in England, has it? Yep, that's correct, Chair. Um, up until now, we've been operating on the basis of a guarantee from the Treasury, and that has basically been Treasury's best estimate of the funding, the additional funding they'd provide to Whitehall departments. They have now looked at um, the GB department's figures for this year as they're doing their own supplementary estimates, and as a, as a result of reconciling that against the guarantee, they've realised that the devolved administrations are actually due additional funding, and for us, that equates to some $300 million which was just notified to us on the 15th of February, beginning of this week. We are, however, able to carry that funding forward to next year. Joanne, is that mostly health, is it, or was it from other areas? I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but it would be a combination of areas. Okay. I imagine it's significantly health, but a combination of areas. I mean, I'm sure if the committee wants, we can provide the, those details. Okay. And obviously, you'd be aware of the sort of the correspondence and discussions been going on between the Secretary of State and the Minister of Finance over the uh, victims' pension and commitments. Um, can you advise uh, where we are in terms of allocating any of the remaining unspent resources for 2021 and the consequences of the Barnett consequentials for COVID spending? Whether any of this can be used for victims' pensions or any of that discussion has been made with Treasury? Because I think the Minister has alluded to the fact that there are. He, he has concerns that the figure that they originally thought is significantly larger, but we're being asked to look at a. We're, we are not being told what that figure is. And can you give us any sort of guidance on uh, what that figure is? Because I understand the TEO has now provided figures to your department. Okay. Uh, firstly, I don't, I don't have the detail of the, the figures around the victims' payments with me because they don't actually form part of this bill, being that those, uh, that funding is needed for next year not for either the current financial year, and it's not included in the voting account. Um, you're correct. Uh, the TO have uh, asked the Government Actuaries Department to prepare a report for them, which will provide more accurate figures, but as I said, I don't have the detail of those figures. It, but they will be a cost to next year's budget. In terms of can we use the unspent COVID funding, the unspent COVID funding um, that we had prior to the announcement on the 15th of February needs to be spent this year. Unfortunately, the Chief Secretary doesn't, is not allowing us to carry any of that forward. Therefore, it can't be spent for victims' pensions when those costs will be incurred next year. The additional funding we got at the start of this year, of this week, the 300 million, we can carry that forward, and there conceivably it would be available for victims' pensions. However, it has been provided for COVID support, and there is no doubt that that funding will be needed for COVID support next year. These are things that the executive can consider as it's, as it's uh, looking at its final budget for the year, and indeed the, the monitoring rounds in the early stages of the year. 
So the additional 300 million is specifically for COVID support. It has been provided as a result of funding given to uh, Whitehall departments for COVID support. Uh, my understanding is the, the executive is not restricted as to what it could spend that on, but given that it has been given as consequences of COVID support in England, there may be an expectation that it's used for COVID support here. Right. Okay. Okay. Jim. Mr. Alistair. Jim. No, clever Jim. A right. uh, couple of points, if I might. Does the uh, uh, vote on account include any new services for next year which aren't within the ambit of the um, present budget? Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to turn to uh, Roshin and Jonathan on that. They're more over the detail of it, underpinning that. I mean, it is it is possible, it is permitted that new services are included if there's if there's is the legislation to, to back those up. Perhaps Jonathan or Roshin would like to comment on that. Oh, you're on mute, Roshin. Sorry, uh, the voting account it provides finance for existing services to continue within the first um, few months of the new financial year. Um, Pending, obviously, the main estimate um, and the budget number two bill. Does that mean there are no new services? I think if, if we can, rather than give you false information, that, I mean, I think off the top of our heads, we don't think there are, but rather than give false information, I think we'll, we'll undertake to come back to you on that, okay. just to confirm. Okay, the second thing I wanted to ask was about the headroom. I'm reading yes. here about a billion pounds of headroom. Surely the situation in proper accounting process is that the spring supplementary estimates and the budget bill should be written exactly to the last monitoring position, should it not? In ideal circumstances, yes, it should, it should be written to the final position for the year, which is normally the last monitoring position. However, given the unprecedented circumstances we're in this year, and the level of funding which is currently has not been allocated if we were to stick to the monitoring position departments would not be able to spend any further allocations which would mean that that funding would be returned to treasury you're right there is a considerable amount of headroom in these estimates some of that has already been allocated to departments on the 10th of february the time taken to prepare as i'm sure you'll appreciate it's a very sort of bulky document so it, it doesn't get printed overnight the time taken to prepare means that it is based on the February, 2nd of February position. There have been allocations uh, included uh, or announced on the 10th of February, which are reflected in headroom here, but are actual allocations to departments. On top of that, there is an additional significant amount of headroom to allow scope for additional allocations as the COVID situation develops and as departments come forward for proposals to spend the currently unallocated funding. But it's a false position. I presume we don't have a billion pounds spare. No, you're, you're correct. We don't. I, I think the, the actual figure for headroom, which is now unallocated, is, is around the 850, 860 million. And you're right, we, we don't. We have around 300 million, I think, unallocated if you take the resource capital and FTC into account. However, we can't be seen to preempt executive decisions. So we have built in scope there for allocations to be made. If we knew where the executive was going to allocate it, we wouldn't need headroom, so to speak. Now, departments are also constrained by their budgetary position, and all departments and their accounting officers and ministers are aware that they cannot spend money that they don't have the budget cover for. So a load of headroom does the estimates allows some 800 odd million more than has currently been allocated. Departments are aware that they can only spend that money if they have a corresponding budget allocation agreed by the executive and announced to the assembly. But, but presumably that headroom is coming from money unallocated at the centre. and money that departments haven't surrendered is that right no, not necessarily haven't surrendered though that could be the case i would hope that we will not get any surrenders between now and the end of the financial year given that the january monitoring round is usually the last opportunity for that but it will come from funding that is unallocated at the center however it is greater than that because it's for the executive to decide where to allocate that funding and those decisions haven't been taken yet. Yes, but if we were just to restrict the headroom to the amount of funding available, that would mean that the executive would have to make the allocations to those departments which had the headroom built in. This leaves their options open as to where that funding, unallocated funding, will ultimately go. Perhaps I'm that another um, way just... of saying sorry. Is that another no, way of, is that another way of saying 
that you're building headroom into multiple, multiple departments, even though you don't have the funding for that, so that the executive can move it about wherever they want? Not move it about, and I'll maybe let Jonathan come in because I get a point to make, but not move it about wherever they want, but so as the executive can decide where to allocate the funding that is currently unallocated. Now, within that, some of those departments, as I say, um, for example, the DERA 9 million for forest, ser 9 million headroom built in was for forest service, and that has already been announced on the 10th of February. Similarly, the health, allocate, the health headroom of 175 million for PPE and the 15.2 million is for trust capital, again announced on the 10th of February. There are other amounts in there being, I think, primarily for DFE and DOF, where headroom has been built in to allow either extensions of existing schemes as, as the situation develops or new schemes to be developed. And at this point, it's not clear where that funding will go. So we have, yes, we have left the, the option open. Sorry, Jonathan, did you want to come in on a point there? Yes, I was just going to say that the the reason why, um, or part of the reason why the headroom is uh, a, a multiple of the budget that's allocatable is, is partly um, due to the uncertainty that you've talked about there, Joanne, and especially actually if we think back to the 2nd of February position, which was the January monitoring round, so at that point in time the uncertainty was even greater, and w one of the ways that I've um, sort of tried to have an analogy in my own head is it's like court cases. If you had three court cases that could each cost you £10 million, but there's only a, a sort of a one-third chance that you lose any one of them. You, you will only need the £10 million budget, but the headroom would need to give you the option to uh, put it in any one of those um, departments. And that's what Joanne was kind of alluding to there around the, um, the level of uncertainty around the schemes. Um, a lot of departments are, as you know, um, building schemes um, at, so at some pace. And this, uh, if you like, allows them to explore the practicalities of it and then allows the executive to make the, alloc the actual allocations to whichever ones are the most promising. Whereas at the position um, where the, the estimates were, uh, if you like, finalised, the departments didn't have that level of detail around how, you know, how much was practical for them to spend, how much would they need. A lot of these schemes are demand-led, so it takes them some time to, to work those details through. But, but just explain to me, reconcile all of what you've just said with the spirit of Section 64 of the 98 Act. You'll have to remind me of what it says. Well, <laughs> Sorry, I was about to say the same thing. Well, let me read it to you. The minister shall, before the beginning of each financial year, lay before the assembly a draft budget, that's to say, a programme of expenditure proposals for that year, which has been agreed, etc., etc. At least 14 days for laying a draft budget for a financial year, the minister of finance must lay before the assembly a, st a statement specifying the amount of UK funding for that year notified to the Minister. Same time as laying the draft budget, the Minister must lay before the Assembly a statement showing the amount of UK funding required by the draft budget, that the amount does not exceed the amount specified a, under subsection 1A. Surely you are now speculating a billion pounds of headroom, which does not equate to the funding notified to Northern Ireland by the Secretary of State. I think if I can come in there, I think Section 64 relates to the budget and not to the budget bill. Um, and departments will be constrained to the budget that is available and the level of funding that is um, provided by the UK government and through our own rates income. There is no doubt about that. What the budget bill does is, is provide sort of legislative authority for, the, for headroom for departments to spend more if the executive chooses to allocate that budget to that but department. Are you, uh, does your headroom include money beyond what has been allocated, beyond by the Secretary of State and beyond what you have? It does, but it does not allow departments to spend more than their budget allocation. There are two separate controls. The budget bill is the legislative control, which controls the level of cash that departments can access and the, resource, and the resources they can use. However, Departments are also constrained by the budget position, and it is the budget position that Section 64 relates to, not the budget bill. And that budget position will not allocate more funding than the executive has at its disposal. Building headroom into the budget bill is allowing the executive discretion to allocate the money that is available to it in its budget. 
and why it is the headroom is more than the budget available is to allow that flexibility as departments work up schemes in the middle of this pandemic which are best able to support people and to use the funding that's available but if we don't have the headroom in there the and we constrain this to the january monitoring position or indeed the second february position departments would not be able to spend any additional allocations which means the money would automatically go back to treasury because we couldn't spend it but you've already told me it should have been written exactly to the last monitoring position and it deliberately is <laughs> not does that also yeah, have I, does that I'll also explain. Sorry. in normal circumstances it would be written to the last monitoring position in this case, the last monitoring position concluded with money still available and departments still developing schemes for COVID support. So if we had written the estimates to the last monitoring position, that money that was unallocated at that point would have had to have been returned to Treasury. By writing headroom into the estimates, we allow the, the executive to allocate that funding and ensure that it doesn't go back to Treasury. But departments are constrained by the budget position and so will not spend more money and, and the executive has at its disposal. And does Treasury approve this process? Treasury does not approve our budget bill process, but Treasury will accept that headroom needs to be built in because it's not in anybody's interest to constrain the executive's ability to spend and the funding Treasury, available to funding. Does, the does, Treasury accept, does Treasury accept an artificially inflated headroom? As I say, Treasury do, do not approve our estimates process or our budget bill process. That's a matter for the executive and the assembly. I, I haven't had the conversation with Treasury, nor do I know what approach they take themselves. You don't feel any requirement to have that conversation? No, Treasury don't, do not approve our budget bill. The, the Section 64 relates to the budget, which is, which is, a, different, which is a different process. And yes, there, there is that requirement to come in to and reconcile to the figures notified by the Northern Ireland office. And that has been complied with. We did this, this statement 14 days before the finance minister brought a draft budget to the assembly, but this position is not based on a draft budget. This is the final position for the year and a vote in account for the following year and doesn't relate to that draft budget in any way. The final point I wanted to ask just... you was, does this mean that if departments overspend under this aegis that they don't have to do any uh, excess votes, don't have to provide any explanations? You're correct that there will not be an excess vote. They will provide explanations because if there is a budget breach, we would anticipate, uh, well, we would require an explanation and we do hold the right to take it off the department's budget the following year if they overspend against their budget controls. And if the executive as a whole breaches its budget controls, Treasury will take that funding office next year. So it's not in anybody's interest to spend more than is available in their in their budget, regardless of, of what the budget bill has authorised. Thank you. Okay, Matthew and then Philip. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, thank you uh, uh, for, your, for your evidence, guys. Um, Joanne, could you just r remind us, given the always that things move so quickly, as, as of right now, what is the unallocated um, amount in both? Uh, RDL ca conventional capital and FTC for 2020-21. Okay. Um, following the allocations announced on the 10th of February, the unallocated funding um, was 249.7 million resource DL, 10.7 million capital DL, and 55.7 million financial transactions capital. So a total of about 316 million. Um, on the 15th of February, Treasury um, announced that we would get an extra 300 million this year, but that we could carry that forward. So I'm not counting that in those unallocated amounts because that can be carried forward to next year. So there's still the M so we basically have uh, if you add them together we have six hundred million of which three we have six hundred million to either six hundred million of which half of which roughly we can carry forward to next year. Is all that three hundred that came through in Barnet Ardell? No, it, it's a combination of all uh, the three resource Dell, Capital Dell and a bit of FTC. And um, just so we're absolutely clear, but what is in, in relation to what's unallocated for 20, 2021, have the Treasury said that the only flexibility other than the budget exchange scheme will be that 300 million announced on the 15th? Yes, that, that's the current position. I mean, we are still having discussions with Treasury, but that's the current position. Yes, so all of the money that was um, unallocated at the 10th of February now, now needs to be spent. 
So they haven't the flexibility that you thought would come from the two hundred million in December hasn't come. What they've actually done is say, well, actually, there's more Barnet money after all, uh, even later in the in the in the in year process, and you can carry that forward. But um, so you've got literally sort of with weeks to spare or days to spare, almost they've said there's an extra three hundred million, and you can carry that forward. But the two hundred from December is not going to be can't be carried forward. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. The, the two hundred from December, which we were led to believe they would they would look sympathetically to carry forward, has now not been allowed to carry forward, and I can only assume that that is because there's such um, high levels of additional funding have become available so late in the year, and they're allowing us to carry that forward. But you're absolutely right; we can't carry forward the two hundred million from before Christmas. Uh, and did they give an explanation why the two hundred million couldn't be carried forward? No, unfortunately, Treasury don't have to give explanations. <laughs> they just have to give decisions. Um, my own assumption would be that at the time we were having the conversations with that, they weren't aware how much additional funding was going to come out later in the year. And given that there's now for, for Northern Ireland alone some 300 million coming out in, in the middle of February, I think um, Treasury feel that that is sufficient to be carried forward. And the preference is obviously that we spend the money available before, Christ uh, available before Christmas. Just so we understand it, just. For because sometimes it seems like an opaque process. When you say Treasury says, does that take the form of an email to you or Jeff McGuinness from I actually, you know, a named official saying, oh, by the way, you're not going to be able to carry that forward? Or is it, when it comes to this stuff, is it a formal letter from the Chief Secretary to the Finance Minister informing him of what, what which is it? Is it, is it, um, in, in this case, um, it's a formal letter from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to the Finance Minister. And on just on the what's unallocated thus far, um, uh, there um, are there any, so the, of the of the, so the on the tenth of Feb, as of the tenth of Feb, you had that three hundred million, the two four nine resource, and the ten capdale, and the fifty seven FTC. Um, how much uh, have there been any? I mean, presumably they haven't been agreed by the executive. You might not want to tell us in specific terms, but can you give us a sense that maybe most of that, have there been bids to cover most of that? Um, it was not so much bids as an ongoing iterative process with departments. So I think that the departments are working up a number of proposals, yeah. and those are. As you say, we haven't went to the executive yet, and we're, we haven't got all proposals in from all departments. But in some ways, they are reflected by the areas in which headroom have been built into these estimates. Uh, where the headroom has been built in, those are the areas where departments are exploring um, opportunities. And I think the fact that the headroom is so significantly higher than the amount available is hopefully a good indication that we should have proposals which are sufficient to spend the money that are, is unallocated at the moment. And what are those areas? Just for the. Uh, yeah, um, Department for Communities is a headroom of 205 million. So my understanding is that, that they have some proposals that they're working up in terms of, of support for other sectors and some sort of internal to the department. Um, department for Economy is the other big bit of headroom, which is 316 million. Um, included in that is the 27.3 million, which is allocated on the 10th of February for um, student support. But they're also looking at their current their current schemes and any new schemes, and three hundred million of that is also in the Department of Finance, and again looking at extensions of the LRSS or any new schemes. Yeah. So those are all things that are being considered, and those proposals will be brought to the executive in due course. The other big amount of headroom is Department for Health, one hundred seventy-five million. That was actually allocated on the tenth of February, um, and that was the PPE, which was possible because Treasury have waived the sort of normal budgeting rules for this year for COVID PPE. Yeah. Okay. And um, so those are um, those are so the, the two big ones. Then are basically half a billion collectively for DFC and DFE. On the um, DFC one, well, actually on both of them, just remind us, like what sort of for lay, for the lay person, what what act, how does the money? What does it actually mean that the money has to be uh, spent this year? Uh, what does that mean in practice? If it's a support scheme, it doesn't clearly mean that the, the that the grant actually has to be paid to the business. But it, what, what what is the uh, is there a degree of flex that the Department of Finance has in terms of what, just explain that if you could? Right, there isn't there isn't really any flex that the Department of Finance has. Um, I'm sorry, I, I say, I'm not going to explain it in terms that aren't on technical. Basically, it has to score its expenditure in the de department's accounts. 
which means that there has to be a sort of a certainty around the payment going out. Um, you can't just uh, announce a scheme and say, you know, we're going to spend 300 million on this scheme, and that's not sufficient to support expenditure in your accounts. You would need to know exactly who it was going out to and when it was going out to. If, for example, you had, um, say, an applications process and, and the applications had come in and you had approved them, but you just hadn't spent the money, that would probably be sufficient to allow the expenditure to score this year. But if there's any uncertainty around it, it wouldn't be. So, uh, sorry, it's a bit of a technical answer. If, it, if it's certain enough to score as expenditure in departments accounts, it will be treated as expenditure in budgets this year. If it can't get into the departments accounts as expenditure, it won't count as being spent. I, I, I get that, but there's still a degree of um, subjectivity there. Whose decision is it as to what is it the accounting officer, uh, is it ultimately the accounting officer at the Department of Finance who decides whether it can score as expenditure, or is it does the accounting officer at the submitting department have to say, I am satisfied, or is there more? Sorry. Sorry, it, it, it's. it's uh... There isn't the degree of subjectivity you would think um, the accounting rules, normal accounting rules apply, and I'm so I'm sort of oversimplifying them there. But ultimately, departments' accounts are audited by the audit office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, the department would have to be satisfied that the audit office would accept it as expenditure in this year, and then ultimately the audit office would have to look at those accounts and agree with the assumptions that the department made. So there really isn't a great degree of subjectivity or of flexibility, and it's not something that the Department of Finance has a great deal of control over. It's not a decision we make. It's the application of the accounting rules. Indeed, but there still is, and it's maybe subjectivity is too loose a word, but there still is, a, there is some degree of judgment on behalf of the accounting officer as to whether they are satisfied. No, I mean, I, no, not, 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 not really. It has to be quite definite before you can accrue a cost. So basically, the, the, an accountant would have to be satisfied that they can accrue the cost in their accounts. And you know, while I've tried to explain that you don't actually have to get the money necessarily out the door, yeah. you do have to have that sort of firm expectation that that money, and that's probably the wrong word, but basically the money's near enough out the door before you can account for it in that way. OK. Um, fine. Uh, and then just finally, if I may, Deputy Chair, just on the... Um, on, can you just say a bit more about the um, uh, accelerated passage? And it sounds like, given what you've said before, that in a sense there's the department's view is that accelerated passage is more necessary this year than in a normal year because of what happened earlier in the financial year. Is that what you're saying to us? That you think it's that there is that the the legal flexibility that. Then there is, is flexibility here that does exist for the Department of Finance per sec to authorise expenditure in the absence of uh, royal assent is reduced this year. Yeah, um, there's sort of, sort of two elements to it. Yeah, accelerated passage is necessary in any year, and we're not unique in that. I mean, Treasury would have the same process there. Spring supplementary estimates last year went through um, Parliament in, in two days, so that's not unique. So there's always the need for accelerated passage. Otherwise, the position that we are writing the bill to would be even more out of date and you would have to build an even more headroom than we have done in this case. Yes, it, the position is exacerbated this year. We do have this, this flexibility or sort of contingency arrangements whereby if a department runs out of cash, you know, say there is an unexpected bill comes in or something, something happens, a department can come to Department of Finance and ask for an advance of the consolidated fund for contingencies, but that we are limited to the amount we can approve under that. And that limit is 2% of the previous year. So in, in a normal year, as you're approaching the end of the financial year, that may be enough if there's slight delay in royal assent to get those departments required to run out of cash, enough funding to keep going. But in this year, it is very definitely not going to be enough to get those departments over the line to the end of the financial year. If you, in a normal monitoring round, you tend to spend a lot of your time recycling money and department surrender reduced requirements, and that goes out to different departments. We don't have the same sort of level of new funding coming in in year. This year, we've had an extra three billion of new funding coming in to be allocated. And basically, the, the contingency arrangements just cannot cope with that. Um, the advanced consolidated fund contingencies is slightly different from the Section 59 letters that the Permanent yeah. Secretary can issue um, if, a, if a budget bill hasn't been passed at all for the year. That might come into play play from 1st of April if necessary, but those are different. In this case, it's very, very restrictive, and I said it's limited to that 2% or 350 million. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, Philip. Uh, thanks, Deputy Chair. I, I, I have to make a point of, of getting in before uh, Matthew in future. I had three questions to ask, and uh, he asked them, them all. Uh, uh, so, I mean, j j just in terms of, of the sort of the point that, that he was pursuing about flexibility, about uh, schemes related to COVID, I mean, can I just further pursue that uh, and ask, you know, is it when the scheme is devised, so, or when it starts, you know, because obviously there may well be schemes going starting in March and going beyond April. So in terms of uh, the accounting of that position, is it, you know, is it when the scheme uh, starts or is it, you know, is the 1st of April the cutoff point for this year's finance, financial uh, accounts and next year it starts? Yeah, there is that cutoff between sort of the, the, the end of March and the beginning of the new financial year in April. Um, what happens with each scheme really depends on how that scheme has been set up and at what stage those payments are at. So I can't really comment on each individual scheme. I wouldn't have that level of detail to say at what point they need to be before they can accrue the costs of this year. But yes, there, there is in some ways an artificial cutoff due to the financial year and, well, and where that expenditure falls, either in the current financial year or in the next financial year. And that is enormous, that's normal. It's, it's not unique to COVID, but it's very unfortunate in these circumstances where you're completely right. The support that's needed doesn't come to an end on the 31st of March. Okay, and then just uh, the, the final point that, that Matthew w was talking about, uh, I can't even remember now what the final point that Matthew was talking about. Um, I think it was accelerated passage. Oh, uh, yes, accelerated passage. And contingency fund. Uh, in terms of, I mean, so, I mean, the consequences for us is that, you know, if accelerated passage isn't, uh, granted, I mean, it, it has a very severe impact both on departments, but ultimately on public services and, and, and people within the North who want this money getting out. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's essentially, there's no other option but to grant accelerated passage. Unfortunately, and I don't want to tie the committee's hands on this in any way, but um, we don't ask for accelerated passage lightly. And there's a reason why budget bills always go through by accelerated passage, and that is because there simply isn't the time to do it another way. And in this, uh, this particular year, yes, if we don't get accelerated passage, departments will start, out, start to run out of cash. I mean, Department of Finance already has, and we've already granted access to the consolidated fund for contingencies. From looking at our cash forecast, the next department starts to run out of cash on the 9th of March, and then very rapidly after sort of around the, you know, the 20th, 24th of March when the pay runs done, departments will run out of cash. And if they do that, they, they physically can't access the cash unless it has been voted through by the assembly and at that point they will have to stop making payments what might also happen at an earlier stage is if departments think there's the budget bills at risk and won't go through they may start to slow down some payments or stop payments in some area to allow them to meet their absolute legal obligations because no department wants to be in, you know in default in that way so yes if accelerated passage isn't granted there are going to be real world implications for department spending and ultimately if we don't spend the money, we return it to the Treasury and it's lost to us. Okay, and and finally, I mean, uh, obviously uh, the committee has an important role in scrutinising the work of the department uh, and, and the minister, and, and we should be asking difficult questions, but but I, I think that uh, we should also uh, accept good, sound uh, explanation w when we hear it. Uh, and I mean, I have to, to say, you know, I was a bit confused by Jim's pushing of the issue of building headroom because i mean obviously you know we have sat in this committee and, and, and the assembly asking to make sure that no money is handed back to the treasury this year that there are very many businesses and, and, and people out there across the north who are suffering as a result of covid and it would be uh, ridiculous to think that the executive and, and the finance minister isn't doing all that he can to ensure that that money does get out. So, I mean, I, I do welcome the explanation, Joanne, that you gave and Jonathan gave in relation to building the headroom and to ensure that the executive and all the ministers have a bit of extra extra uh, flexibility and time to ensure that they can come up. I mean, my hope is that, that, that ministers do come up with uh, schemes to ensure that, that flexibility uh, is used to make sure that people out there get the money that they deserve to get them through this uh, pandemic. Thank you. I, I hope we manage to spend the money too. 
Okay, thank you, Philip. Joanne, can I come in there? Just And again, I tried to follow that as best I could, but my primitive mind sometimes fails me, uh, so forgive me. Uh, can, I, can I ask, that, can the department explain why the £150 million plus has been drawn down from the consolidated fund already whenever we are awash, not, through no fault of your own, of course, but we, we seem to be awash with money. Uh, been sprinkled on from upon high by sovereign government, but yet we've still had to manage a consolidated fund or, or dip into the consolidated fund. Can you explain how that has actually had to take place? Yeah, I, well, I'll attempt, I'll attempt to explain it. Um, there's a difference between the funding coming from Treasury, um, the three billion, because that, that's basically budget cover that the Treasury has given us. And yes, it is backed up with the cash, but the cash is drawn down um, on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis um, through the Northern Ireland office into our consolidated fund and then from our consolidated fund out to departments. Departments can only access that funding, which is in the consolidated fund, if it has been voted in a budget bill. And what has happened to the Department of Finance this year is the amount that was voted through at the time of the main estimates of the budget number three bill in, in November. While it was based on the, the, the latest position at that time, did not take account of, some, of the great amount of additional grants the Department of Finance was going to pay out given the latest COVID position. So basically, the amount in the budget bill at that time was not sufficient to cover those additional grants, which meant that while we had plenty of budget cover to cover those grants, the Department for Finance didn't have the legislative authority to draw the money from the consolidated fund. And the only way to get money from the consolidated fund, other than having been voted in a budget bill, is through this mechanism for an advance from consolidated fund for contingencies, which allows DOF to, limit, to issue a limited amount. And that is what has happened this year. So it has been a timing issue with the, the main estimates and, and between the main estimates and this new, latest budget bill. All departments will hit that problem if this budget bill doesn't get royal assent before the end of March. Okay, and then can I ask, is it, is it a timing thing then with regards to the headroom, the one billion headroom? Now I get it, I get why you would want to create as much flexibility into a devolved assembly situation as possible, given the fact that our destiny is not our own with regards to our budget and plus our tax raising powers. So I get why you would want to try and create as much headroom or flexibility as you possibly could. So is the headroom piece only about coming to the end of a financial year? In other words, the, the vote and account piece? Yep, yeah. the headroom, you're absolutely right. The headroom is completely a timing issue. If we could have held off to say middle of March before putting a budget bill through, then we could have reflected the position at that time, which hopefully would have had all the available funding allocated. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We have to allow time to prepare the documents, which is to accompany the budget bill, draft the bill itself, and then to have this, this scrutiny by the committee and through the assembly process. That all takes time. Even with accelerated passage, that takes time. Mm -hmm. And that means that we can't afford to wait until the end of March or the middle of March to produce the bill. Also, departments will start to run out of funding. So it's absolutely a timing issue. The vote on account is, is slightly different because the vote on account is not based on a financial position. It is a bridging mechanism. And, and the reason for the vote on account is to allow um, the, the assembly, the scrutiny of the executive's budget position. What it does is the executive will announce its budget position in March. If we were to try and bring forward a budget bill then to put in place the spending authority for the 1st of April, one, we couldn't wait for that budget in March, but two, we'd have to do it very quickly. What this does is say, OK, we know that we need time to scrutinise that budget position and to bring forward a budget bill placed on that. That means that that's not likely to, to be introduced until June time, but departments need to spend money from the 1st of April. Yeah. And the vote and account gives them that ability to spend that money. But it's not based in any way on the budget position. It's simply 45% of last year's allocation or last year's amount voted in the budget bill. And it's set up 45% for most departments because that level does not in any way constrain the executive's decisions on the budget or the assembly scrutiny of the budget. Because even in the worst of years, it's highly unlikely you're going to cut a department's budget by 55%. So they can spend up to 45% of the amount last year without in any way influencing that budget position. Understood. Well, uh, if I could maybe yeah, jump in ahead. On, um, from a mind that's definitely simpler than your own, um, <laughs> I think there's a connection between your two questions. Um, and it's that 
um, departments require kind of hand in hand. The, the money needs to be available in order for them to, to, to spend it, but as well as that, the assembly needs to have, if you like, voted the approval, they need the lawful authority. Yeah. And if you go back to your first question around, um, you know, why did DOF have to access um, the, the contingency mechanism, even though there was plenty of cash around, is because the latest, if you like, the latest word on um, the lawful authority, the latest word that the assembly had provided was at the second budget bill, and it didn't cover the amount that DOF, because of the additional work they were doing, that they required. And there's a similar kind of dynamic with the headroom where what we're doing is we're providing lawful authority for a number of different routes, but we actually, in this in that question of yours, it's it's the cash, or well, it's the money that is restricted. Um, you know, we will only probably um, allocate, uh, you know, uh, if we're lucky, we'll allocate out all the money. Um, but we need to provide the lawful authority for a number of different routes because we don't know yet which ones are practical and which ones aren't. So it's that kind of hand in glove. You need to have the money available, but you also need to have the lawful authority before a department uh, can spend it. So, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, so with regards to the one billion headroom, I, I t and it's to do with the spend this year. I take it that the two hundred forty nine resource that's left unallocated from the 10th of February, the 10 million capital and the 57 financial transaction capital, that's all contained within that 1 billion headroom. Does it also include the 300 yes. million we received on the 15th of February? It, it doesn't really. It, it would give scope if, if all departments, um, if the executive chose to allocate the full amount that it can, given the headroom that's in it, would allow scope to spend that money. But in reality, it's more likely that money will be carried forward as that flexibility exists, and therefore the executive will only allocate the funding that it currently has, so the, the 300 million that was available after the 10th of February. But yeah. uh, in principle, the executive could choose to allocate up to the full amount that's available this year. Yeah, so the, the headroom is the headroom, and in the cash and the money is the money, which is slightly different. The headroom is only the flexibility, the parameter for which that money is contained in, if I'm right. I visualise it in my yeah. head. So, so all of those, all of those departments that are beavering away at the minute feverishly, trying to uh, put in place funding mechanisms or schemes to spend. Uh, how, how then? Why then is there no work, no real uh, detailed work being done yet on the victim's pension? Whenever we see clearly that there is a legal duty on this executive. Uh, so in the space, in the time given, and given the headroom of a billion, is it an active plan that whether it be executive office, Department of Finance or Department of Justice, or three, all three maybe, is there active work going on to ascertain the exact amount or given what you said to Matthew about money having to be allocated to not just shovel ready projects but, but projects that are quite uh, mature and, and we know exactly how much they will be needing, needing uh, matured like that. Is there any work being done for the victim's pension uh, at, at this present time before the end of the financial year? Yeah. I mean, there, there's ongoing work going on in the executive office and the Department of Justice to, to get the, the victim's pension scheme up and running. But the actual payments themselves, um, with the best will in the world, will, will not be needed. And the funding for that will not be needed until the next financial year. So the headroom that is built into these estimates only relates to the 2021 financial year and comes to an end on the 31st of March. It's next financial year where the, where the funding is needed for those victims' payments. So that could be covered by the vote on account if, if those payments happen, happen quickly enough in the year, but they will be reflect, reflected in the executive's final budget. Hopefully it'll be resolved by then and be reflected in the final budget for the year. But it's not an issue for these um, SSAs. However, you're right, there is work going on in the background in DOJ and TO and DOF are being kept informed on that. So, so there we're left, is no delay to the scheme. Yeah, so we're left in this perverse situation where we have the headroom, and I understand why, but we have this 250 million resource. We have this 300 million that's came upon on high. And we were, there's going to be, if we don't, if we don't get that money allocated, there's going to be a transfer 
whereby we keep the 300 that's just been allocated to us and we give back mm -hmm. some amount of money. Now, with that 300 giving you the additional flexibility that is in the entire headroom, surely there's something that can be done with regards to allocating the money that we may lose in April to allocate that to a victim's pension and then allow that 300 because otherwise we could just spend some of the 300 million on the victim's pension next year because we're able to forward that on but surely is it not more economical for us if we instead of handing that money back to the treasury actually using that money part of that money because i'm sure we'll allocate most of it but using whatever's left and has in danger of going back encapsulating that into uh, the pension scheme and surely if there's work done now in the month of February and March we should be assured of what we will actually need to spend because remember the victim pension payments were meant to be first allocated a summer ago so there must be some work done in an accountancy as to how much the spend would be Unfortunately, it, it's not as simple as, as knowing what the spend would be. Um, my understanding is that, um, well, DOJ are progressing the scheme, but I, I think with the best will in the world, that scheme is likely to open for application sometime in March. It will not be sufficiently progressed to allow us to score payments to the victims in this financial year. And yes, you're absolutely right. It, we have unallocated funding there, and it would be better if we could allocate that funding now. But that funding has to be spent by the 31st of March, and the victim scheme is not in a position to do that. Treasury have refused our request to carry forward the funding we received just before Christmas, which means it has to be spent in this financial year, so therefore it's not available for the victim's payments. Of course, you're right with the flexibility to carry the 300 million forward um, for the next financial year. That does provide additional flexibility for the executive, and that is something that can be considered as the executive works towards its final budget. Um, it is unlikely. In fact, I would say it's a definite that we will not be able to factor that 300 million into our final budget because the treasury do not allow carry forward in that way to be factored in until later in the year but the executive will be aware that that funding is available to make decisions based on that but unfortunately we're not able to allocate any of the funding that is currently unallocated for this financial year to the victims pensions much so, as we might want to do so it's so, just not possible so there's no doubt but there's going to have to be some money go there for to the department of justice uh, for the infrastructure around the victim's pension. So is there a possibility that you could allocate that money for the infrastructure for the pension scheme and then at some point, either this year or next year, reallocate that from infrastructure to pure payment? Um, my understanding, and I'm, I'm going off the top of my head so I might be wrong, is that the Department of Justice did get some funding this year for those sort of administrative costs of setting up the scheme, and, and definitely there was an allocation of, I think it was about six or seven million in the draft budget for those administration costs. So that funding has already been provided. There isn't scope for any more of that, and, and the accounting rules wouldn't permit you to um, accrue for a payment without the basis for that being there. So there, there simply isn't. The funding has been already been provided in their budget in the draft budget for those administrative costs or for the infrastructure as you put it so, so that is already in place the only question has been over the funding for the payments themselves and you are aware um, of, of the entire executive's view that the uk government should be contributing or paying for that given that the changes that went through at westminster yeah. those discussions are ongoing but nobody is disputing that those payments have to be funded C can i ask it, then, but it can can't be from the funding available this year yeah can i ask a question then about borrowing because everyone i think everyone to a person in this committee realizes that the the cost of borrowing is so low now that it, it's it certainly gives you an additional flexibility to borrow uh, and it may well be a good thing. But there's always been this concern in my head around the burden of uh, borrowing and the cost implications and the interest payments. Now, in the budget, the draft budget document, it shows the estimated annual cost of borrowing, but it's centralised. But I'm led to believe, and I, I could be wrong, and you'll correct me if I am, that individual departments have a burden on that interest um, and I'll give you an example I can remember talking to infrastructure officials a number of years ago about schemes or road schemes and he lamented that 
that he had so much of his budget was going out on interest payments that it was it was and a term that was used last week was silting up his department. Uh, can you give us some insight as to that? Is that burden of interest and borrowing centralised, or is it down to the departments that I actually avail of the borrowing? No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I can't speak to the Department of Infrastructure or what they were actually talking about, but no, it's completely centralised and it, it is handled at a central level. There's, there's no burden on the department. There should be no difference to the department between a project that's funded through borrowing and a project that's funded through conventional capital deal. It is completely centralised. They may have been talking about uh, the private finance initiative, which is which is different. Right. Okay. And in that case, the ongoing and free charges would, would be a burden on the department, but that's different from RRI borrowing. That's exactly what it was. Uh, yeah. You, you've 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 sold that for me. But but so RRI borrowing is completely centralised. But all the other yes. borrowing we've had over the last decade or fifteen years has been individualised. Is that correct? Well. It would only be for private finance initiative or PPP, public private partnerships, that the departments don't borrow in any other way. The executive can borrow only through the reinvestment and reform initiative. Those PPP contracts are, are different. And yes, that would be down to the individual departments themselves. Yes, and it's the individual department's decision on whether to enter into those contracts. Now they are, I mean, there, there are quite a few, I think, sort of um, historic contracts. I'm not, I'm not aware of any new PFIs. No. How, coming on board, so I think that's something that there, there may be historic interest there, but there's no plans for any additional ones, as far as I'm aware. This may, I'm just going through this at you. Probably don't have the detail at hand, but do you know how many uh, departments have got the PPA or the PFI uh, borrowing aspect, and and do you see it as a problem with regard to setting up a department's budget? Um, I don't have the details of which departments do. I'm sure we can find out. It's actually sort of. Um, coordinated by the executive office as far as I know the details of the PFI projects so I don't I know that um, it's completely correct DFI have a number of big roads projects yes um, so it may be a bit of an issue for them I don't think it's an issue for other departments but what we can certainly um, undertake to try and find some details on PFI projects for the committee John uh, the urn uh, Southwest Acute Hospital was a PPI uh, of 240 yeah. million and when You're I was right, yes. involved with health, we had to find £100 million to pay some of that off. So you might find health has got some big capital projects there as well. Uh, can I ask... Yeah, ask you're completely uh, right. I forgot about that one. And, and final question, Joanne, I promise. Uh, can, can I ask then, is there any means or way, in an accounting sense, that that, that could ever be reallocated into a centralised pot? Because in the best way in the world, a hospital helps us all. And helps all departments. A road network helps all departments, and helps the executive as a whole. Uh, so it strikes me that even though it was a the department's decision to fund something that way, that actually the, the, it helps all, all of us in society, and and it could well add additional flexibility if that was so, that burden was somehow somehow centralised. I don't think now off the top of my head, I obviously don't have details of all departments would have the, the opportunity to look at buying out their PFI contracts if, if that provided better value for money and certainly they could come forward with proposals for that. I don't think centralising it would really benefit um, anybody greatly because if we took the burden on centrally, the burden is still there and that would simply reduce the funding that's available for all departments. So it may help the department that initially took the decision and benefited from that decision by building the hospital or by building the room, but it would penalise those departments who didn't take the decision because come off the available funding before it was allocated out to those departments. So it, it, it wouldn't help in the overall scheme of things. It may help individual departments, but it's likely to penalise other departments. But as I say, that's off the top of my head without having the detail of all the, the individual PFI projects in front of me. It, it may be a very pleasant problem if you're sitting at the end of a financial year about to hand money back, if that could have been allocated for that burden. I don't think it could be allocated that, that simply. I mean, if the department could have bid, if the department had issues with funding it, they could have bid throughout the year, or the department themselves could come forward now with a bid for that money and we could consider it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to ask back the chair of the committee. Uh, absolutely. Thank you can have that today. burden. Yeah. Alicia. Yeah. Alicia, <laughs> do sure. oh, you still want to come in? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
made it a whole lot shorter in every respect. Just thanks ever so much for all of your answers to that uh, to date, covered m most issues. I just one that sort of uh, jumped out at me that uh, whenever you give the figures, we'll say at the present time, uh, for those departments who have made bids uh, uh, in relation to uh, ensuring that the monies are spent uh, rather than them being handed back, uh, you prioritise uh, communities, um, uh, economy and health. And has any bids been uh, submitted from uh, infrastructure? Wait, there, there is. Sorry, I've lost the detail of it. There, there is some um, headroom built in for infrastructure. So yes, that that they they have they are considering proposals. As far as I'm aware, that there there is headroom built in for them. It just wasn't um, as large. The main ones I picked out were the, the biggest amount of headroom that was built in were economies, infrastructure, and DOF itself. But yes, DFI has a headroom in there, so they are they are considering. Proposals. Yeah, because it was the one area I know we've already raised it as well too. That where uh, we would have felt that uh, you know there was many sort of what should have been seen as uh, speed ready projects type situations in particular for infrastructure. So I'd be more than disappointed if uh, they themselves hadn't a substantial building uh, building that in there, especially uh, for provision in the rural communities. Uh, that where uh, we've been crying out for uh, improvements there. Uh, and I, have I, don't a, I have a question. Point me just uh, 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 plowing what other people have already, or rather following what other people have already plowed. So thanks ever so much once again, Grandma. I you. actually have the figures, Monisha, if it would be helpful um, for yeah, DFI. Um, the resource headroom um, is 21 million and the capital was 51.5. So right. uh, not as significant as, as the other ones that uh, Joanne had mentioned, but not, not an insignificant amount to either. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Is it? Thanks very much, Mr. Sir, could you just come across? What's the justice figure, by the way? Department of Justice figure. I don't think Department of Justice has any headroom built in. Is that correct, Jonathan? That's right. Yeah, there's, it's, no, it's, there's no headroom. No. Yeah. None. Yeah, none for the Department of Justice. Okay. And I suppose I would, just, I would just like to clarify, Chair, that um, the headrooms built in has been um, at the behest of departments, um, not DOF determining who gets the headroom. Obviously, we agree whether the headroom should go in or not, but we don't actually you know, say which, what headroom should go to which department. Um, I just find it surprising with the sort of pressures on policing and various other th issues that the Department of Justice haven't um, sort of looked for headroom. Yeah, it's possible that those pressures are emerging in the next financial year, whereas the headroom only relates to this financial year. So it's only for funding that can be spent before the end of March. And that's probably why they, they don't need it this year. It'll be next year that they, they'll have the pressures. We're also... Um... Yep. Sorry, Jonathan, you've frozen. <laughs> Like there were also a number. <laughs> Come on, fight it through, Jonathan. Fight it through. Uh, I think we've lost him all together now. No, he's back. Sorry about that. Um, I was just going to say, Chair, that um, to be fair to some departments, um, there were some departments who were more, um, if you like, who had more certainty around what their position was. So they, um, they were able to bid slightly earlier. Uh, so while we do have departments that have built in very significant headroom, you'll see it is those departments which are, if you like, that have the, faced the greatest uncertainty because of COVID. Those are the ones that have built in um, the most um, headroom. There were other departments who, who were able to, with more certainty, if you like, um, definitively um, put forward their position at uh, spring supplementary estimates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Looking around. Um, Joanne, Jonathan, Rushing, thank you very much indeed for your evidence and thank you very much indeed for coming along. And I apologize for the uh, communications and the uh, crinkly, crinkly links back and forth. But uh, thank you, and we look forward to talking to you again fairly soon. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Right, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Um, members, do we have any other further comments? Uh, do we wish to seek uh, further legal advice as to whether, when well, we're talking about the legal authority for the sort of when they talk about the one billion pound plus of allocations made since Budget Number Three Bill would be lost if the Budget Bill 2021 was not passed on the 24th of March? And if the executive's discretion is indeed limited to cash allocations of no more than 2% of the previous year's block grant, uh, i.e. around about 200 million in this instance, would we like some 
further information on that, or do we think we have got sufficient information to make our decision whether we are in a position to grant accelerated passage as it is? Probably got enough, Chair. We have had a gun put to our head. Mm. We're told that the departments are going to run out of money on the 24th of March and stop paying things. I mean, we've put, been put in an impossible yeah. position, and so, Joanne has led it on. We obviously, has been told to lay it on thick that uh, the, the entire province's buildings will fall on our heads if we don't do it. And it'll all be Jim Wells's fault. Yeah, yeah. and therefore, we're, you know, what, <laughs> it's a ridiculous situation we've been put in. You would be no good up over Jim. Year. <laughs> Whole words listening. <laughs> <laughs> All Jim Wells' fault. <laughs> oh. um, no, again, Jim and his sentiment is, is correct with regards to the functioning of, of the place and, and ensuring that uh, money can be allocated and spent. Um, it seems to me that the question that is posed to the chair at this point in the year with regards to um, scrutiny. Is a, is, a, is a really unfair one to, in many degrees because I don't know that we'll ever have enough time to scrutinise. Mm -hmm. So in many ways you're sitting, you're standing up there uh, making an announcement that you know, in the best way in the world, we have never, and it's probably a dilemma that's been faced by every financial finance committee chair. Uh, but it's whether we have had a sufficient enough amount of time to scrutinise and whether that makes way for the greater good. Um, I'm still of a mind that uh, at the minute I still don't have enough, have, haven't had enough sufficient time, but that's not to say that we won't have by next mm -hmm. next week whenever the the own account is laid or whenever it, the whole thing has to happen. Um, I, I, we're here to hold the, the department's account uh, or department's feet to the fire on many uh, on many issues and all issues. But we're also here to help and assist. So it's getting that balance right. It really is. Okay, Matthew. Uh, to the chair. Oh, sorry, Malisa. Uh, Matthew, then Malisa. I think Malisa was in before me. So he... Oh, sorry, Malisa. Sorry, apologies. Hello, could you hear me there? Yeah, we can, Pat. Yep. Pat was first. I raised my hand about 20 minutes ago there, sir. Sorry. Say again, Pat, sorry. Uh, do you see I've raised my hand there? Is that, is that visible yep. to you? It's gone now, yeah. It's gone. Sorry, it went. Sorry. Go ahead, Pat. No, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll come back in after everybody else is No, finished. no, no, you're here now. <laughs> well, just, um, you know, when you were talking on the point, it would be nice if I could have had in when the officials were there as well. But look, they're, they're gone now. I think we've no option uh, but to go ahead and, and, and to agree this passage as it is. What you had said there, Chair, was about that 2% of the previous year's block grant. Uh, which adds up to two hundred million pounds. I'm not sure that a letter or writing at this stage w w would alter that. But to go into what Malaysia had said and was talking about uh, the Department of Finance, I know that the Department of Finance did make a bid uh, by last July, and that was turned down by the Finance Minister. The problem that departments have for making bids now is about whether they themselves have the capacity in order to get that work out and finalised. So there were extra bids made by different departments, but for whatever reason, I don't know, but I know that the Minister of Finance turned them down then. Okay, thanks. Alicia? Yes, uh, Chair, just uh, again to the whole um, uh, position in relation to accelerated passage and that, and that whilst, uh, as has already been well explained to us uh, exactly why it is that we find ourselves in the position that we are in, uh, I do think too it is time that we took a, a vote on this and, and, and moved ahead and accepted that accelerated passage is, um, is acceptable to this committee. Okay. Matthew? Um, so I suppose I make two comments. One is that this has been an extremely unusual year and at several points uh, we haven't had there's been a lack of clarity and we haven't had uh, as much information as we might have liked. The other one is that um, we have done a lot of scrutiny and we, you know, um, I, I mean, speak about my experience from when I was a, a, like an official working on some of this stuff and you know, supplementary estimates and uh, that some of the legislative processes around this they don't get uh, at what, like they don't get debated for days and weeks on end. Uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, as Joanne McCurney said, 
These aren't subject to normal legislative processes in Westminster. Okay. Um, the, but the scrutiny process is out with that. It's via the debate on the actual budget document that's laid. It's via the committee. It's via other debates. I have a lot of uh, concerns, questions um, about uh, about you know how we're doing about you know the budget process this year and whether we've managed it properly and how we improve it in the future. And I'm not sure that's the same thing. I'm not sure the answer to that is. Uh, delaying accelerated passage this year, and I'm not sure what necessarily that would. The, I'm not sure the outcome of that would be uh, better scrutiny. To be perfectly honest. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, uh, Tim. Just so that you're aware of what. Um... <coughs> sorry, Chair Philip. One oh, Philip. Sorry, Philip. Thank you. I mean, just briefly, because the, the point of kind of, I mean, uh, I, I agree with Melissa. I, I, I think that there, and Pat uh, and even Matthew, you know, there's no other option. Uh, delaying the decision to not, to allow accelerate passage achieves nothing. In, in my view, there are many other options through this committee and for other committees uh, in terms of scrutiny of, of the budget. I mean, and I think. It's really important to remember why we are at this point. We're at this point primarily because the British government delayed uh, its budgetary process, and secondly, because the finance minister struggled to get uh, the assembly's budget even onto the agenda of the executive on a number of occasions. So none of that has helped. Uh, but I mean, in terms of our role within this committee, I mean, I, I just you know we can wait till next week or whatever. Melissa's proposed that we take a vote now. I mean, I, I mean, it, it would be shocking if we made any decision other than uh, grant accelerated passage. Yep. Thanks a lot, Philip, coming in. And I was just about to make my remarks before you came in, but I think, look, we are in unusual circumstances to say the least. Uh, the fact that we've had COVID, the fact that we've had an extra, I think it's now 3.3 billion that's come into our uh, in, into Northern Ireland from the rest of our nation to deal with the with COVID and where we are at the moment. We all accept that we're in unusual and difficult circumstances. The issue about uh, money being carried forward, and last week we thought it wasn't going to be carried forward, and this week we now know it is going to be carried forward. I think there are extenuating circumstances. I think in, if this was a normal year, and uh, if there is ever such a thing in Northern Ireland, if it was a normal year, I think we would have real concerns, and I would continue to express those concerns. But at this present moment in time, as I see it, I don't think we've got any other option than to grant with degrees of, um, degrees of concern that we would have, but we will make those clear when I make my remarks on accelerated passage. And indeed, uh, for the issue of sort of the ten suspension of standing orders, go ahead, Jim. I, I, I'm very reluctant to agree with you. That means we will not have properly scrutinised any budget for the last five years. I would probably say I'd, I would. We would have to go back a bit further than that to the last time there was any real proper scrutiny of a budget. Well, there was a three years of suspension, and last year, of course, we came back in January, and we simply had to rush things through. And now, because of different circumstances, we have to do it. So, five years, this committee has not actually fulfilled its main duty. Just so you know, bear that in mind uh, for, 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 for noting. But uh, Joanne was obviously sent on there to, to warn us of the consequences if we don't. No, I uh, ignored all that. But. Absolutely. <laughs> she, was, she laid it on thick there. We can see what the. I know, but I'm afraid that, that just went. <laughs> yeah. I, did, I didn't really have much concern. Yeah. There is, sorry, just, an, just another issue, of course, because. One of the things that will be changed about the next budget as we go forward is the Fiscal Council. If we expect it's going to be laid for the executive tomorrow, the Fiscal Council will be in place as well. So there will be indeed significant changes. And I think that should have a direct input into how we are looking at scrutiny and how things are presented, um, particularly across the whole piece of government, or I hope. Because that is one of the main sort of reasons we wanted to have a fiscal council in place to, to look at that as well. So, Melissa, asked your question. I know you said we should take a vote on it. I don't believe we're in a position where we have to take a vote on it. But if you wish to take a vote and it's been duly recorded, I'm quite happy to put it. But you know, I am minded to at this stage. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Uh, is it this week we have to decide? I thought it was another week. No, I think it's next week. Yeah, next but, week. Uh, sorry, I, I'm, but I think if it comes before us next week, I am minded. Um, 
I am minded to uh, be supporting accelerated passage due to the extenuating circumstances. If, that, if you're content okay. with that, Mason. Chair, yeah, I could just comment on it. Yeah, just one second. Sorry, just let Mason speak. So I would prefer that we go ahead and take the decision now rather than uh, putting it off until next week. Yeah, I was just going to add, because Jim's quite right with regards to what what you know has any committee in the previous history of this place had time to scrutinise any budget. And I think the question comes down to what do you ascertain as scrutiny? Mm -hmm. Because, as Matthew says, a budget, I don't even think a budget in Westminster gets consultation. No, it doesn't. No, no so, no so, so, in a devolved settlement like this, there's a consultation before the budget bill, which is probably unique. Uh, but so it's the question is what does scrutiny look like? Because if if we think that scrutiny of a budget is the same as a committee stage, uh, then that we're, where we are, you know, going through a bill of any sort and bringing in people to interview and to examine and, and go through each detail. What we're really basically talking about in a budget is budget lines and numbers and knots and pound signs. So. It's two different things, really, compared to any other piece of legislation, and and the way a devolved assembly does it is quite unique, uh, quite strange in many ways. So the question is, I think, for a committee, is what does what should scrutiny of a budget bill look? Or sorry, what does scrutiny of a budget look like? Because it's not even the bill. The bill doesn't come to June. So so what does the scrutiny of a budget look like? And and that's not the same as any other committee. Thank you. Sorry. Apologies, Tim, if I look slightly distracted, but the screen here is sort of switching you off, switching you on again, and making you either much bigger or much smaller as we go. Pat Sorry, Pat? Sorry. Pat? Thanks, Thank you. And uh, uh, just uh, already, what I was trying to say here is, I mean, if I look down through it, I would love to be able to put something into this budget about the COVID recovery. We don't have the time for that. We have all of, we have all of the, all of the, the, the officials were on there, and they talked about all of the problems that we've had. Part of what I can, you know, hold on, sorry, folks. Um, I don't think that we've really had the chance on this committee in order to put forward or to drive on our ideas in order how we're going to try and help to revitalise the economy as we come out of it. But we have no other options now but to vote and agree on this accelerated passage. And maybe, as Chair has said, with the Fiscal Council, it may well give us a better briefing uh, on, on the next term as we go into it. Thanks, Chair. Matthew. Yeah, I think it's worth reiterating the point that um, though I think we have, have not always had as prompt information as we could have done on clarity, uh, some of which is to do, down to do with the you know like fault lies in multiple sides, some of which is down to do with the Treasury, who have not bothered to confirm yet to us whether they will give us evidence. Some of it is down to the Department of Finance, and sometimes um, they haven't been. Um, prompt enough and clear enough and give us information, but there is a difference between the legislative process of authorising spending yes. and a sure. budget document. Yeah. Uh, what we need to do is, like, we have evidence, I think, coming up after this from the um, Irish Congress of Trade Unions and, and, and a think tank uh, about the budget document. That's part of our budget scrutiny process, um, and we have, a, we have several weeks still of Budget scrutiny, which I certainly, for mine and my party's part, intend to be very robust. In as Pat just said, coming up with suggestions, ideas, that's that's critical. I think, and it, you know, you can make the argument. I would, you know, the you could make the argument that we, if we are doing our jobs properly in a multi-party mandatory coalition, we should be loud and noisy through the budget consultation process in arguing for creative solutions, new allocations, new ways of working. Um, I, I'm just not sure that um, the delaying, not authorising spending this is the way to address that. Is the way to do? If you see what I mean, it's a slightly different thing. It's a simple, yeah. Look, uh, sort of, uh, from as the chairman's position, I'm minded to grant accelerated passage, and I believe I should be. But if Malisha, if you want to put it to a vote, sort of, uh, please propose it, and we'll put it to vote. But I think well, from. I 
Yes, I propose that now, Chair, because I think that we're dancing on the head of a pen in every other respect, uh, and that I'd like to make that proposal formally. Okay. I'm going to have a seconder. I'll, I'll second it. Uh, seconder isn't required, and it's a matter for you. you to okay. To okay. I'm happy. Right. All those in favour of granting accelerated passage say aye. 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 Right, members, can we do show of hands so because then we can count <laughs> to? So, uh, All going? those in favour of acceler accelerated passage. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And against? Nil. Abstentions? One, two, three. Good. Passed. Motion passed. Yeah. Right. Chairperson, if the committee is content, I'll, uh, the chairperson yes, will then write to the speaker yeah. and copy to the business hmm? office indicating. And, and to the finance minister, minister as well. And to the as finance minister well. too, of course. Okay. Done. Okay, Excellent. Thank you. If we can move on to the next item of the agenda, oral briefing on. Number oh, item number nine. Okay. If we move on to item number nine, which is the Northern Ireland Committee, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, and the Nevin Economic Research Institute, uh, Owen Reedy and Paul McFlynn. If you're there. Yes, Chairman, we're here. Hi, Owen. How are you? Good to see you again. Very good. Very good. Good to see you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, sir, apologies. We have uh, we had some IT glitches earlier on, and we've been bouncing back and forth and been talking about budget. No so please, please don't take it as any disrespect from the committee, and we're absolutely delighted that the two of you are here to uh, give evidence. Uh, I'd like to remind members that this session has been recorded by Hansard. Members are advised that the following part papers are relevant to the agenda. Clark's covering note on page 523, and the NIC IC2 paper in the draft budget at page 527. Owen, would you care to make an opening statement, please? Yes, thanks very much, Chairman, and uh, we're very grateful uh, to you and the committee for the opportunity to, to address you here today. I'll make a few brief overview comments, if that's okay, and then hand on to my colleague Paul McFlynn. Maybe just to put it in context, Chair, obviously we're the All Island Trade Union Federation, the sister organization oh, of sorry, the TUC oh, in just, Britain. Just, 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 just to stop, uh, sorry, I should have made a declaration. I'm a member of the Union of Unite and have been for some considerable period of time. And are obviously, and I'm obviously closely associated with the trade union movement. Uh, sorry, I apologise, committee. I should have made that uh, uh, right at the beginning of the declarations of interest. Sorry about that, Owen. Not at all. We're delighted to hear that, Chairman. Um, so we are the the trade union federation on the island of Ireland. In in Northern Ireland, we have the Northern Ireland Committee, which is an autonomous body, uh, which looks after the trade union affairs in Northern Ireland. We have two hundred thousand members. Uh, we're probably the largest cross-community civil society organisation, organising those workers through through 24 affiliate trade unions that you'd be very familiar with, British and Irish unions. Um, and uh, the members that we represent are public sector, private sector, urban, rural, blue collar, white collar, right across uh, all parts of the economy. Um, a couple of very brief general remarks about the draft budget. Uh, we, we think there's a fundamental uh, wider problem. Uh, the budget is, a, is pretty much a flatlining budget when you take out, obviously, the very important additional monies that were necessary and, and very welcome to deal with COVID-19 and the one-off NDNA uh, amounts of money. Pretty much the budget, when it comes to day-to-day -day spending this year, is not that different uh, from each of the budgets in the last uh, decade. And quite frankly, the commitments that were given in Stormont House, Fresh Start, and indeed an NDNA to rebuild and uh, restart the Northern Ireland economy haven't uh, come to bear, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously, and you've been discussing the, the impact of the pandemic on budgetary matters. The, the, the impact of the pandemic has been incredible. Uh, it's been very, very significant. Having said that, it has also demonstrated and given us a glimpse of what is possible. For example, we were told that you couldn't move tens of thousands of workers from the workplace to home overnight. You can. Um, many would not have thought that a Tory government would have, for example, decided as, re as, as early as last April to fund workers' salaries who were furloughed up to the tune of 80%. So it shows what can happen, and sometimes it takes a crisis to do that. But we believe we must look at this budget in a, in a different light, and particularly when you look at the potential around a draft program for government with the nine outcomes, um, they, we think they will only succeed uh, if we get proper, adequate, consistent multi-year funding uh, through a multi-year budgeted process. And we believe that the uh, pandemic has demonstrated beyond doubt that there is a, an urgent need to adequately fund and resource the state. 
uh, if you look at chart three of our paper, uh, which was on page two of the short document we sent you, you will see quite clearly that uh, in the UK, we have very, very low levels of public spending per head of population. When you compare us with other uh, normal modern states in Europe, um, you know, nothing radical, just other wealthy uh, industrialized states, we compare unfavorably when it comes to public spending. And this low level of public spend is intrinsically linked to a low level of revenue. Um, and we've looked at this in some detail, and, and, and Paul and his colleagues in the Nevin Institute have looked at this as well. When you compare UK employers and what they pay on workers' national insurance, it is equivalent to 41% of what their sister companies and sister employers in other industrialized Western European countries would pay. This is not about being in Europe or outside Europe. I'm comparing, I'm comparing the UK with Germany, with Norway, with Austria, Belgium, other wealthy uh, similar uh, countries uh, that, that, are, that are industrialized. So it's 41%. Now, if you were to bridge that gap over a decade, over say a 10 year period, because we, we appreciate you cannot increase national insurance costs on employers today, tomorrow, or next year until they get out of the pandemic. But if you were to do this, say, over the cycle of two governments, over a 10-year period, you would generate an additional annual £121 billion for the state every year. If we look at that in a Northern Ireland context, that's £3.5 billion in extra revenue. And we think that's crucial. Um, and if we were to do this, this just brings us into line with other Western European democracies. It doesn't, it's not a radical idea. It doesn't bring us too far ahead. It merely just brings us into line. And we believe if we're looking at budgets, notwithstanding the fact that this is a reserved matter, obviously tax, uh, particularly on national insurance, is a reserved matter. We do believe it's essential that the executive, that the parties in the executive and in the assembly, and crucially the Minister for Finance, needs to form an opinion along with his colleagues in Wales and Scotland, um, because obviously it's important that the three devolved states have a view on this and have an informed view on this. And if we don't do this, and this is the fundamental issue, if we don't address this issue now, we will find ourselves dis discussing and debating a cycle of flatlining stagnant budgets, where we will be arguing, should we take X from communities and give it to health? Our why from health and give it to education and it will be a circular argument and the thriving productive entrepreneurial economy that we all want in this region of the UK will not come to pass so we believe there needs to be a fundamental rethink a reframing of the narrative and on the discussion of the type of budget that Northern Ireland as a devolved state within the UK should have I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague chair if that's okay thanks okay thanks John. um <clears throat> Okay, if anyone can hear me. So, um, as Owen mentioned, um, I'm from uh, work for the Nevin Economic Research Institute. We are a sister organisation um, of the ICTU, and we are supported by their affiliate unions uh, to provide uh, research on economic matters. In in my case, uh, pertaining to to Northern Ireland. Uh, in looking at the, the budget for the forthcoming fiscal year, as, as Owen touched on it, the most, uh, most concerning um, aspect is the immediate uh, non-COVID uh, budgetary um, uh, position. Um, and um, obviously this, was, this is mentioned within the, the draft uh, budget itself that um, the, the consequence of uh, new decade, new approach money uh, coming in last year, flattering um, that budget position uh, and leading us uh, to 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 a to a, a standstill uh, for this year, um, and even but I think the the point I want to make is that even if we had the new decade new approach money um, uh, approved for the forthcoming um, fiscal year, all we, we would be doing is moving uh, a problem from this year um, to the next year. Um, and the problem that we raised with the financial package that came with New Decade, New Approach uh, at the time uh, last year was that um, lots of the funding um, was extremely vague uh, and, uh, and promissory, but the funding that was decipherable was misapplied, and misapplied in the sense that it was using one-off funding 
um, to uh, to meet uh, recurrent uh, expenditure needs. That was always setting us up for a, for a fall, um, and it looks like we're we're, we're taking it um, uh, this this year. Obviously, um, the 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 intention um, from the uh, from from the executive's point of view was hoping that uh, the Barnet uh, expansion over the, the coming years would rise uh, to meet um, that gap uh, in funding. And I think if we look to the most recent spending review, it's quite clear that it isn't going to happen anytime soon, and it's, it's not in prospect um, anytime soon. As Owen mentioned, the, the central problem here is that Northern Ireland has been dealing with uh, the same uh, budget and day-to-day expenditure for for almost um, for almost ten years, even if you look to capital spending, there's greater volatility there, but certainly uh, no discernible uh, growth trajectory. I would say that given this kind of stasis, and I, I don't wish to 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 offend any officials in the Department of Finance, but it is it would if you look back at previous budgets for for Northern Ireland over the last couple of of, of years. It would be possible to design an algorithm to set Northern Ireland's budget every year if you add in um, unavoidable pressures in health and expenditure and then divvy the rest out uh, proportionally uh, to departments. You end up with, with roughly what we're, what we're dealing with here. And to be clear, I don't see that as a, a problem with a root in, in Stormont. It is, as Owen mentioned, um, the root of the problem is within Westminster and the low revenue low uh, expenditure model that the UK has uh, has morphed into uh, since uh, the austerity program that began in, uh, in 2010. So in that sense, attempting to criticize the Northern Ireland executive or, or, or some such for the, for the overall level of, of Northern Ireland's budget is, is tilting at, at windmills. The big problem is um, at Westminster, and what the what the intention is uh, for the for the environment of public expenditure and revenue generation in the UK over the over the medium to, to near term. Uh, as Owen mentioned, there are proposals in the in the document that you have in front of you, particularly regards to to issues like uh, employer social contributions. And I would say that the countries that that that, that the UK is compared unfavorably uh, to there are some of the most productive and competitive uh, economies um, within Europe. And it is more um, more than uh, feasible um, for the UK to, 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 to rise to that level um, without, um, uh, without, without having any adverse uh, economic uh, impacts. But, um, but in, terms of, in terms of an overall budget commentary, I think that's where, uh, that's where discussion would be uh, more fruitfully uh, aimed at. Um, but I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, thanks very much indeed. But, uh, thanks very much indeed, both Owen and thanks, Paul. Look, a couple of questions, obviously, leaping to the fore. Um, one of the big issues we have in Northern Ireland is particularly sort of duplication of expenditure we have in the education system, where we ha- we're we running two or multiple education systems at considerable cost and indeed don't really help delivery of outcomes for our children. That's a significant issue. We've obviously got health transformation that's going to be needed through sort of Bengoa and the implications of that. So there are to be, transformation itself is going to be challenging, and particularly for sort of the trade union movement, are going to have to realise that there are going to have to be some significant changes if we're to achieve the kind of level of transformation we need. So if I could have an answer to those first questions: What degree is the trade union movement realise that transformation is going to significantly affect? Uh, how sort of the employment market may look, and how sort of some uh, efficiencies might have to be made to enable us to achieve that. Um, the second question, and I was interested when you talked about sort of a view on sort of, um, as you are well aware, the finance minister is quite keen to have a fiscal commission uh, that will be look over a period of about nine months to probably potential uh, tax raising or other uh, resource raising powers. But I was noted that you said you needed to really do it in conjunction with the Scottish and the Welsh as well. So I'd just like your, your views on that. So if you could give us the answers to those two, that would be quite useful. Thank you very much, indeed. Yeah, th- thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think it's, it's not lost on us, of course, that uh, you need to see transformation uh, across the public service, and we need to see a different type of productive, uh, participative labour market in general in the private sector. But I suppose that can only be done and that can only be delivered if there's true partnership and if there's a, a true and serious attempt 
to engage the trade union movement. And in my experience in, in the four years I've been in this role, I have to say uh, that apart from England, Northern Ireland is the next place in Europe uh, which has the lowest level of social dialogue where trade unions uh, and other social actors, employers, farmers, community and voluntary sector can sit down together and can work collaboratively on the type of society we need. Uh, because, you know, health and education isn't just of interest to health unions and education unions and, and, and health and, and education employers. It's of interest to wider society. And um, it, it strikes me that we don't have that approach here. Um, I, I've used the example before that we, 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 we have an involuntary five-party coalition uh, and we need, we need uh, that level of cooperation horizontally, but we need power sharing vertically as well. We need stakeholders in society, trade unions and others, to have more of a, a say and more of an influence. I, I don't think transformation can be done to us um, because people will resist that. It needs to be done with us uh, and with the workers uh, involved in those areas as well. My point about the your, your, your reference to a fiscal commission, I know south of the border there, there's a fiscal advisory council. Um, my point about Scotland and Wales is that uh, as a devolved state in our overall interaction with Westminster, the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly should be arguing and saying that when it comes to tax raising powers, there needs to be a, a wider scope to build the state and to fund the state. Let's remember every employer who quite legitimately and quite rightly is being supported through, through this pandemic and the jobs that are being supported, they need to realize that the state has to be resourced. When we have a pandemic like this, you can't just you know go to the well and, and hope that there's something there. It needs to be replenished and everybody needs to pay their fair share and there needs to be adequate tax justice. And we don't have that when we have 41%, uh, uh, when we have the employers paying as little as 41% on employers' national insurance vis-a-vis -vis their counterparts elsewhere in Europe. Okay, thank you. Matthew? Um, thank you. Uh, thanks both. Um, so, I just wanted to ask a couple of things. One about um, fiscal council and fiscal commission. Um, have you had any, uh, either Nevin or the ICT, you had any formal representations or discussions with the Department of Finance about, <coughs> about those things? Uh, I just say we, we haven't, Matthew. No, no one's engaged with us on that. I'm not sure if Paul has. Yeah, I, I should just say um, we have had um, uh, discussions, my, uh, my colleague uh, Lisa Wilson, in regard to the Fiscal Commission, um, not the Council. Okay, that's really helpful, thank you. And um, you said, Paul, I think you said something really acute there, which was um, about um, the uh, NDNA funding basically be being a one-off part, but with a high degree of opacity about uh, exact, you know, numbers and uh, and basically it being soaked up even in a, in a you know a unique year being soaked up to meet ongoing resource spending rather than uh, one-off costs, and then that has created a uh, a sort of standing issue. Where um, uh, do you think that has this? So this is the first that is a unique thing to be dealing with not a unique it's not unique, sadly it's not unique in this place but um, we're dealing with that in this draft budget process in, in, the, in terms of the consultation um, have you um, has the consultation been more um, uh, thorough and more an improvement on uh, what happened when there was no um, devolved administration. Sorry, that was a very long-winded way to ask what was quite a straightforward question. Uh, do you see an actual improvement in, with there being a minister and an executive to consult with? Uh, yes, I mean, un un undoubtedly, the budget process that was uh, was there when the executive wasn't in place was uh, bizarre. It was handed down from the NIO sometimes, you know, uh, last thing on a, on, a, on a Tuesday evening. So, and it is, um, I, I, I heard some of the discussion earlier about, you know, about the, the committee and its uh, scrutiny of, the, of the, the budget. And it is an odd one when we think either of the Westminster budget or in terms of the budgetary process in Dublin, in, in that sense, a budget is brought forward with no pre-consultation, but 
ultimately you have finance bills where things and the details of things are worked out and sometimes some of the stuff that was put into a budget to you know to be eye-catching or to get the news eventually gets uh, gets softened out uh, as it collides with logic uh, and uh, debate uh, in so it's it's kind of it's kind of like northern ireland just has it the other way around um, there is a, there is scrutiny and discussion um, before uh, the final uh, the final uh, budget uh, budget vote, but um, but but I suppose w w within that, I mean, the, your point about the the the, the NDNA is, is one that we we, we tried to make last uh, year in terms of the the budget um, the budget consultation. Um, because because there was kind of a, a certain euphoria about the return of devolved uh, government that kind of wasn't maybe taken into to, to account and a belief that you know there was good faith in in terms of uh, of the NDNA funding um, going uh, forward I think that quickly unraveled but the degree to which there could be a discussion about that was overtaken um, by COVID but I wouldn't say it's unique it, it has been a sort of a consistent problem and every time maybe there's a deal with the UK government or something like that. There's a, there's a belief that fiscal problems in Northern Ireland are like a blockage in a pipe and that just takes one sort of pot of money to fix the problem and then everything will, will flow uh, freely rather than a more structural uh, problem, which is going to take a commitment, a financial commitment in, in, in years uh, uh, to, to overcome. And, and one of your um, paper, which is really helpful, basically talks about um, the, uh, I mean, I very much agree with you on the relatively low level of, um, you know, of, uh, uh, since 2010, um, the, the effect of austerity. Um, you specifically talked about um, basically employer NICs and, and increasing employer NICs as a, as a way of revenue raising. In terms of local uh, taxation, we are facing here um, the main local form of revenue raising is um, rates, obviously, and in a weird way, COVID has accelerated structural change in the economic activity, which that is taxing. Um, uh, so there are big, profound questions that need to be asked about whether that's a viable way to raise revenue in the future, given that we don't know if there will be anywhere near the volume of commercial property, basically, to tax um, because of the shift in how people, um, uh, how people um, shop, etc. Um, have you given any thought to other forms of locally raised revenue that you think would be, um, uh, and, and including that, you know, things that the Fiscal Commission or Fiscal Council might look at in terms of dev dev further devolved powers? Um, I, I take your. I, I definitely take the point on on rates because I think that's that's one that that comes up um, that comes up every year. I think. Um, there possibly needs to be a discussion of, you know, exactly, particularly on the, you know, on the, the, the residential side in terms of, of, of equity, but also in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the commercial environment over the next couple of years is going to be quite constrained um, for using that as a revenue source. But I think in terms of, uh, of, of property-based uh, revenue generation, we wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be getting above sort of norm European norms in terms of how much, what percentage of of, of, of revenue is generated uh, uh, from that. There, you can only you can only squeeze that um, uh, so much. I think in terms of in terms of um, of, of, of of other taxes that could be or uh, revenue possible revenue generation that could be further devolved to Northern Ireland. I, I, I have to say I, I'm quite nervous about it, and I, I, I look to the experience that has taken place in, in Scotland um, thus far in terms of uh, in terms of both uh, income tax uh, devolution and um, the apportionment of um, of, uh, of of that receipts a certain percentage of that receipts to the Scottish government, um, and the. Big thing that I would say there is, and I, I, I welcome the establishment of the, of the of the fiscal council for Northern Ireland, but um, I don't think even in Scotland, and as much as more developed as its governmental institutions are, there was an appreciation for the um, for the amount of work that would be involved in managing um, uh, the the devolution of those kind of uh, that kind of range or suite of uh, of revenue uh, uh, generators, and I think that's. That's a, maybe a big discussion that make, needs to happen in conjunction um, with the fiscal council. I would say just to comment as well in terms of when we talk about 
you know, uh, options that are open to the executive at present, there's often a kind of a, um, a, a, a people mention in the same breath between revenue generation and charges and user charges for public services or, or public amenities are, are, are quite different and they are by their nature uh, regressive and obviously tend to, to take uh, more from, from lower income households. And I think that's kind of an area that, that we want, that, I, that we would certainly not recommend uh, getting into uh, either. Okay, okay, that's really helpful, thank you, Chair. Any others? Jim. Um, yeah, I just asked, in the union's experience, how many successes have you had over the years of devolution in perfecting change in a draft budget? Uh, hi, Jim. I'm not aware of, of, of any, frankly. Uh, I've only been in the role four years, but going on your, your, your conversation earlier on about the scrutiny and things like that, I, I'm not aware of, of any um, because it seems to us the draft budget is is essentially there is an envelope and there is a package and it's about you know shifting it around a little bit and and the minister for finances is, is akin to a you know a, a chief accountant of a firm sure. so no but what we're talking about here today and what we're proposing is something much more fundamental than merely merely moving things around it's it's a different way of of, of raising revenue across the UK so in truth I think we're probably agreed that the consultation process is really a charade? I'm, I don't know about I'd call it a charade. There's a level of engagement, um, but, uh, you know, the executive has limited head scope. I go back to the point Paul made earlier on. I mean, we're not here to criticise the executive on the allocation of money to this department or that department, because the alternative is you end up robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're questioning the whole premise of how budgets are formulated in Northern Ireland and, and the, the, the model of revenue raising and the amount per head uh, in the UK that the state uh, spends and, and raises, and it's way, way behind other modern progressive economies, and that's what we need to aspire to. But your approach would still be based upon a block grant, though a more enhanced one. Yes, it would be. It, well, if, 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 if what we are proposing were to come to pass, and we appreciate it would have to be done over a period of time, you can't just turn on the switch and it happens overnight, it would be over a decade. You're looking at an additional 3.5, 3.6 billion in revenue for the executive to allocate. And then I think we could have a proper uh, serious debate about uh, what we need that 3.5 and 3.6 billion for. I mean, that would be a significant additional investment in the Northern Ireland economy. And should the executive be tasked at all with any revenue raising powers? Well, it, it, it seems to me, based on the, the question that Matthew asked Paul earlier on, I mean, rates, rates account for about 5%. Um, of overall revenue, so you're really tinkering at the edges there. Um, you know, I don't really see uh, right now uh, any other significant methods of, of raising money um, in a Northern Ireland context until we, mm. I suppose, broaden the tax take, um, whereby employers pay the appropriate and right uh, amount of national insurance because there has to be tax equity and there has to be tax justice here. So. In short, the answer would, would be no. It's more a fundamental rethink in how the state is funded, Jim. And you don't see any threat to employment levels in increasing employer overhead? Uh, of course, I don't think that should be done today or tomorrow. We fully support the supports that businesses are receiving uh, right now. But what are we advocating? We're advocating that employers over a 10-year period pay what employers in Austria, in Norway, in Germany. These aren't kind of, you know, radical left-wing, uh, you know, states. They, they are by and large run by centre-left or centre-right politicians like the UK, like the Republic of Ireland. Um, it's nothing radical. We're just saying we should catch up to where we should be. Um, and if it's done in a managed and a multi-year budgeted way where people know what is being expected of them. Because when I talk to employers, and I talk to employers a lot, obviously, in my, in my work, uh, what they say they need is certainty. So let's give them certainty, but let's say 
to equip ourselves for the pandemic, the state has to be resourced. I heard uh, Paul Frug earlier on talking about about about, um, about borrowing, uh, and obviously the state has had to borrow significantly um, to to fund the pandemic. Uh, but if the state was properly funded and resourced, obviously it wouldn't have to borrow to the same extent. So it's about getting the foundations right. Of course, an employer could add anything that adds to the increase in in in, in labour is a cost. But you could have that argument about increasing the national minimum wage every year as well. Uh, the sky still doesn't fall in there. Of course, the state is not some abstract. The state is the taxpayer. The state is the taxpayer, and, and what we're advocating is tax equity and tax justice. I should say, for completeness, workers across the UK pay 67% of their peer equivalents uh, in Europe. So there is scope there as well. But the tax uh, income tax system in the UK is not as progressive as in other states. It's not as progressive as in the Republic of Ireland, where people who earn more pay more, and rightly so. So, you know, there is more that can be done, um, but we believe the most obvious place to look and the most glaring uh, inequity is 41% on employers' uh, national insurance. That's the best place to start. But as I say, it would give us 3.5 billion over a 10-year period, year yearly after a 10-year period. But from what you've just said, you want to see both employers and employees paying more. No, what, what I've said is the first place to go is the employers because that's the biggest it's inequity. Out, I'm, yeah. saying there is, I'm saying there is headroom uh, for workers who earn you know, uh, high, high salaries to pay that little bit more. Yes, there is. The, the studies that we've done show that workers in the UK pay 67% uh, when it comes to their taxes on labour vis-à-vis uh, -vis their, their peers in Europe. So there is scope. Um, but you should start with the glaring inequity, which is 41, uh, and the employees that would have to pay more would be those on significant six-figure annual sums. It wouldn't be your low and middle income earners. They pay uh, disproportionately more uh, because the UK tax system isn't as progressive, for example, as the Republic of Ireland one. So it would just be union bosses and people like that? Well, can I tell you, Jim, I, I, I pay, I, I, my contract of employment resides in Dublin because we're an all island body, uh, and I would imagine I probably pay more tax than you. I'm quite happy to pay it. I think tax is a good thing, it's a public service. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, having paid a lot of tax in the Irish Republic myself, I know how much rather I would be, rather be taxed than it's not there. <laughs> right, okay. Philip. Philip. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Owen and Paul. And uh, I mean, I totally agree. Tax is uh, is a good thing, uh, and if provided that it's raised uh, fairly and distributed fairly. So, I mean, I, I have absolutely nothing to disagree with anything that the, the two of you have said uh, in relation to uh, moving towards a fair society. And I mean, I, I just worry that. As you've pointed out, the, the issues of austerity, given some of the things that the, the, the British uh, Chancellor said in recent days and weeks, that we're, we're actually heading for further years of austerity uh, rather than, than, than optimism. I, I'm, I'm a bit, it's kind of maybe a wee bit disappointed in terms of some of the things you've said about the North getting its own tax variant powers because, I mean, as, as I've just said, tax is a good thing. Uh, and I think that that, that is the basis on how we can uh, move towards a fair society that we have as much tax variant powers and fiscal autonomy here in the north as is possible. I mean, I, I don't disagree that, that the Minister of Finance here should work with his colleagues in, in, in Scotland and Wales uh, to pressurise the British, but I, I just don't know how useful that has been because or would be because, I mean, I've heard the minister say things very similar to you have said, so I'm not even sure he would disagree with, with the things that you've said. So, I mean, I, I think the way forward uh, is getting as much fiscal autonomy here in the north. I mean, I, I could just ask you to comment again on that, and then maybe possibly in terms of the type of policies that you would like to see in place, uh, which would represent uh, you know, a fair budget, a new deal for families and workers moving forward. Okay, well, uh, maybe just very, very briefly, Philip. Thanks very much for that. Um, I suppose my point about tax raising powers in Northern Ireland. First of all, I think we need greater political stability 
uh, I think that is, is crucial, but you could argue it's chicken and egg, which comes first. Um, you know, the devolved state needs to function adequately to, to get more uh, more powers. My only point about the, the fiscal issues in Northern Ireland and tax raising is that if we tinker around with rates, which is which is one of the few r- rates is merely five percent of of the overall revenue. So you know, if you if you if you did something quite serious with rates, you, you're still only maybe going from five to seven and a half percent. You're still you're still just you're still just adjusting at the margins and it needs to be something much more significant. Um, One of the things we we believe is really crucial um, when it comes to framing a regional economy is is productivity. And we always say productivity is way too important to be left to employers alone. Um, And given the nature of the Northern Ireland economy, it's very much a a, a micro economy. There's very few big firms, but the few big firms that we do have employ significant cohorts of people. And we think we need to see, and the fact that employment rights is a devolved issue, we need to see greater collective bargaining greater scope for trade unions to be able to bargain with employers and you know where where some of the employers are very small sectoral bargaining where we can agree norms in certain industries where we can take wages out of competition where it's not the lowest common denominator and the companies compete with each other based on the product that they generate or the productivity and the efficiency not on the labor costs and the labor rates so there's a bit of scope there because uh, employment rights has devolved here, unlike Wales and Scotland. Um, and I think it's good that it's devolved here because our politicians are accountable and, and will realise that it's important to make sure that workers' rights uh, are, are, are maintained and improved. But for us, if we're talking about labour market regeneration, it can't be one-sided. You need to deal with workers as well as employers, and there needs to be a greater balance. I think it's very imbalanced at the moment. Um, and you know, there's no scope for the trade union movement other than at, at firm level to, to seriously and meaningfully engage to try and boost the economy to improve productivity and to generate what we want are successful firms uh, employing people on decent wages with better jobs and i think that fits in neatly to two of the nine potential outcomes in in a, in a, in a potential program for government thanks okay. could i could i just come back there in, in terms of philip's point about um uh, Fiscal devolution, and just just was not to 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 misrepresent sort of the the points that I was trying to make earlier. That I I, I don't uh, we don't sort of see that 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 Northern Ireland couldn't have greater fiscal devolution. But to kind of to and Jim mentioned it earlier in terms of saying you know would you want the same setup in terms of block grant that 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 Northern Ireland has now, and that's kind of I think where I was trying to refer to the problems that you had in Scotland. That the, the you know the kind of the Dell block grants and the the way public finance is administered to 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 regions uh, in in the UK to to try and tack on fiscal uh, to revenue uh, generating uh, powers onto that uh, is an extremely messy uh, way of, of of doing things and it doesn't create maybe some of the kind of uh, hope for incentives that you would uh, that you would get out of such a process. To my mind, I think if there is to be greater um, fiscal devolution, I think you would start by, by um, I mean, the, the Northern Ireland budget is in no way reactive to general economic conditions in Northern Ireland uh, at present. But you would maybe have to get to a process first where Northern Ireland could feel some of the benefit if it decide, you know, if, if at present the Northern Ireland executive wants to, to make reforms that would increase productivity or boost the economy in Northern Ireland, there is no direct feedback loop into Northern Ireland's budget um, from that, that you would first maybe look to, in, to, to put in place that kind of uh, arrangement. And then you would maybe look um, uh, at, uh, and that would alter um, how you would how you would calculate um, uh, the block grant, and maybe over a period of time move to a situation more like a system of f- fiscal equalisation, which you have between states in uh, Australia and places like that, which where it's a much more um, it's a, it's a, it's 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 less mysterious um, or less just blunt population uh, adjustments that recognise the strengths and weaknesses of the different uh, regions in compared to their revenue raising ability and, and public expenditure. But I think it's 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 not just a case as maybe has been in the case in Scotland of just you know devolving uh, a tax uh, rate or a tax um, uh, revenue generation process 
just because, um, just for the sake of it, that that sometimes can, can, can lead to perverse outcomes. And I think there has to be a much more holistic uh, discussion of how we, how we spend uh, 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 revenue in Northern Ireland and how, uh, how we would generate it uh, within Northern Ireland itself. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Okay, thanks very much, Ali. Gemma. Gemma. Sorry, Chair, I need to keep my camera off because I'm after getting an unstable connection warning, so I don't want to miss out. Okay. Um, but no, thanks, Paul and Owen, for that, and it's good to see you both again. Um, we know this budget won't be great for economic recovery, and this might be more for Owen, but... Anyway, um, what are your concerns in terms of the unemployment levels and workers' rights um, coming from that? Th thanks, Gemma. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very concerned. Obviously, we've got a significant number of people on furlough, um, a lot of low-paid people, uh, people in hospitality, people in retail, who their furlough payment takes them below the minimum wage, and that's, that's poverty pay. So we're really concerned about that. We're also very concerned that if you look at the Northern Ireland economy at the moment, one in four of our workers earns below the reliving wage of £9.50 an hour. And of the 12 UK regions, we have the highest proportion of people on low pay. So we are enthused, though, to see in the new decade, new approach, page 44, workers' rights, section X, there is a really, really good clause there. And obviously, we understand that the new decade, new approach was an agreement that brought the five parties uh, back into government. And we think there's an opportunity under that workers' rights clause and indeed economic uh, rights under page 41 of New Decade, New Approach to do something significant in the programme for government and to use the uniqueness of the fact that employment rights are a devolved matter and to do things that actually don't cost money but might actually increase productivity, improve relationships between employers and workers um, so that businesses can be more effective and more efficient for the employer, but also for the worker. So I think there's real scope there if there is a level of ambition. Uh, and I really hope there is. And as I say, page 44, section X of the new decade, new approach is I think the key to that. It, it is about 13 measures that could be looked at and could be used to boost workers' rights. Not at the expense, by the way, of the employer. Uh, it complements, uh, I, I would think, the position of the employer. And I think we also need to see a lot more engagement between social partners and the Northern Ireland executive. Uh, I have to say it's very, very lopsided. Uh, there's not the level of engagement we would like, and we think there needs to be more partnership with social partners and civic society uh, to, to, to work in the interest of everyone in Northern Ireland. Thanks. Uh, sorry, Owen, I, I understand you've got another engagement and heading off to uh, enjoy yourself on uh, Evening Extra tonight. Uh, so at that yeah. point, uh, and apologies to other members of the committee, but I think uh, if Paul is uh, happy to stay on the line a bit more to take some of the questions. But Owen, thank you very much indeed for your evidence and thank you very much indeed for what you've done. And uh, be in touch shortly. Much. Okay. Thanks, Owen. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Uh, team, I've got Paul and Pat and Matthew for a short one to uh, if you want to have questions with Paul or would you be content to send them on for a written answer or would you like to... Uh, I'm happy to ask Paul a question, but I don't know if Gemma has one, if Gemma's finished with her... Gemma, have you got a further one? No, I'm OK. Thanks, Chair. Cheers, Gemma. Oh. Paul? So, uh, OK, uh, can I, just a very quick one. Just, uh, I, I get what you say with regards to a radical change on, on how we do taxation, and I think it, it is getting to the point where we probably do need to do something radical. Uh, you talked a lot, or, or your colleague there talked a lot, about the rate space only being a very small percentage of... of or sorry, the rates being a very small percentage of the base tax base, and that's true. But again, rates is a very blunt instrument which really does need refined and reformed. But so does all of our taxation uh, levers. Uh, but that's only one side of a coin because even if you do change the tax levers, uh, you're giving money into a system that's deeply flawed. I don't think I've come across any government apparatus or scheme or, or department that I say to myself, yeah, I want you guys to have more control over my life. So, so having said that, surely that we need real reform, real reform in our civil service to go hand in hand with radical thought processes around taxation. 
Would you, would you agree with that, that one without the other just will not work? Well, I would say within a within a Northern Ireland context, even of itself. I mean, uh, the chair mentioned uh, earlier about um, you know grappling with the issues about duplication of services uh, within within Northern Ireland as well. And I think there's there's an often overlooked part of that as well, that providing the same suite of public services that is expected uh, at UK level, providing them in Northern Ireland is always going to be that bit more uh, expensive than if you looked at it, um, uh, you know, as a comparison, uh, per head comparison with, with, with England. There are economies of scale, particularly when it comes to, to issues like health. But I think when we're talking about, you know, increasing uh, revenue, and in this case, looking for an increase uh, in employers' um, uh, social contributions uh, over, over a period of time, uh, it's not looking for you know the the dead hand of, of government to to you know to 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 to, to fall on, on more areas of, of life, but it's it's things that actually we've been promising people in Northern Ireland for quite some time. It's uh, it's it's a thing like childcare that the 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 the, the level of ambition that we seem to have about childcare in, in documents never seems to be matched to the amount of money that we are willing to uh, to 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 put toward it. And I think if you asked the vast majority of people in uh, Northern Ireland, do they want, um, do they want a, a significant, well-funded and well-resourced uh, uh, childcare uh, system in Northern Ireland, that they would say yes, and that they would agree um, that they would probably, as, as workers, be willing to pay in a small amount additional more for it, but also that that would be reflected uh, in employers' social contributions. And I think employers would be quite happy to think that that's where a certain amount of that increase was going, was going towards providing um, uh, good uh, quality childcare um, uh, for their workers. And obviously, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, more active participation that would allow within our labour market um, would, would be a further uh, boon uh, to the economy. So I think that's, that's what we're looking at here when we're saying an expansion um, of government. By by all means, if anyone finds waste in government, it should be tackled, you know, at any time, irrespective of 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 of, of what's being uh, what proposals are on the on the table. But when we're talking about uh, uh, wanting to, to to change the game, it is for the big things like that, which, to be fair, have been promised to people in Northern Ireland for year after year after year. But now. Okay, I, I, you, you just cut, dropped off there at the end, but I got most of that. Thank you very much. Again, you know, I've been an MLA ten years, and I've seen the the departments with each budget over those period of times. And again, you're right with regards to the budget hasn't changed much. It's flatlined. It hasn't been any real radical ups or downs. It's always stayed quite an end with it austerity and everything else that goes with that. Uh, and even this year, with all the crises that we've faced and the throwing of money towards us and the inability to spend effectively. Uh, it strikes me that there is massive... The, the, the big prize about devolution, one of the big prizes about devolution was, well, give us that money and we'll spend it better. But we never, ever seem to spend it better and there's never anything ever changes uh, with regards to reform in any of the departments. We seem to be funding the same things as we were funding four or five years ago, and they're bound to be outdated. Uh, so there, there seems to be a, bit, a massive piece of work. But with, with regards, do, do you look upon tax levers, and let's dare I say tax rises, uh, as something just to bring in more funding? Or should it really be about, and again, this is two sides of coins here, is it really about uh, productivity? Uh, increasing productivity, reducing smuggling, uh, removing smuggling from the scene. Uh, you know, I, I, I read a lot of Pitt, and, and Pitt was very good at raising taxes, bringing in new schemes, not least income tax, which was only temporary. But he also, in his earlier days, reduced smuggling in, in some food stuff and, and materials simply because he released the tax burden on that. Uh, is is that a way that we should also look? 
Um, I would well, take, your, take your first point, and I think the reason I, I share your frustration, and I, I said, I mean, I said in my uh, opening statement there that we that we do have this uh, this every year, this Northern Ireland budget, that it is really a function of what the previous year's budget is. And there was the commitment in New Decade, New Approach to move to, to multi-year budgeting. I think that's a good idea, but in itself, it won't be enough. And it's because of the way uh, we do departmental day-to-day -day expenditure, uh, you know, for UK regions, the departmental expenditure limits. It's we sometimes think, uh, you know, in terms of the block grant that we're being given a pot of money to spend in Northern Ireland. We're not. We're being given a we're being given a credit card with a with a limit on it and a year's uh, expiry date. So if you get up to the end of the year and you haven't, you know, you haven't uh, spent your amount, you don't get to keep a pot of money. The credit card just, you know, uh, uh, expires, and it leads to it leads to an administration of public expenditure which really is devoid of any capacity for transformation uh, or, or innovation. Um, and I think that even if the Northern Ireland budget end of it was multi-year, the fact that the, the, the rigidness of, uh, of, 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 of the Treasury in terms of, uh, of uh, annual uh, expenditure limits uh, is, is always going to be a, a constraint uh, on that. And in terms of... In terms of we, when I'm not in in, in favour of, of, of raising um, uh, revenue just for the for the for the sake of it, um, and I think that I think that any uh, any tax tax taxes have to be um, to be both uh, to be be fair and need to be uh, efficient, um, and um, and the the one the, re the reason we're proposing the the, the, the employer social uh, contribution increase is not is to say that that's one area where we are out of step. With our with our uh, comparators, and somewhere that we could leverage uh, additional revenue in order to provide uh, the services that people expect, without putting ourselves uh, at a disadvantage um, uh, to our to our competitor uh, economies. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. I find uh, I enjoyed that. And thanks very much. Um, um, we're all out for time, are we, sir? Yeah. Um, probably, 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 uh, just so the committee knows, we were due to take evidence from Reyes, but I've uh, taken the executive decision to move that to next week and let the Reyes team uh, uh, let the Reyes team away. So I would say uh, a further five minutes of evidence gathering, if you if you don't mind, team, before we draw draw it to draw it to a conclusion. I'll only be a second. I'll be call me and turn on to any other business, please. You sent me an idea. If you can, I'd be. Able Thanks very much, Paul. And uh, I mean, to support these measures and the transformation that's probably needed, I mean, pr part of why I come on to finance, I thought we could have worked some of these out through or some of them out, which, which we could have used within the Finance Committee in order to build the sort of economy that we need in Northern Ireland. But for these six, seven, significant changes that you propose and fewer jobs, uh, responsibilities for the existing employees and the rules that are there for them. Can you back up that there will be job losses in this? And where, where does the the NI, uh, the Northern Ireland Congress, and the ICTU sit on that? Sorry, could you clarify that? I, 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 it just yeah, you, you support this kind of transformation. Have it led to fewer jobs or significant changes to the rules and the responsibilities for existing employees? How do you square that circle? Do you, do you mean in terms of raising employer social contributions would have? Yes, at this moment, it's all right to do it. I know you said it's over 10 years or you're building up that finance to do that. But in the short term, this could well cost us <laughs> jobs that are already here. Well, I mean, I would say that, that uh, a recession uh, as we are in now is no time to, to raise taxes. So, I mean, and uh, so it, it's not only not doing it right now, but it would be even not starting the process uh, uh, right now. But I, I, I really, I, I think that the reason it would be brought in over 10 years is to say that that it is to give the, the economy the, you know, the time to adapt to that. And we did the exact same thing, do you remember, when George Osborne brought in the national uh, living uh, wage. It came in over a three uh, to, to four year period. 
And there was an awful lot of this when the minimum wage was first proposed back in the late 90s. And even within the economics uh, profession, there were people who said, you know, well, there will be job losses, but, you know, it'll ameliorate over time. And the truth was there were no significant uh, employment uh, effects from that because it was done um, slowly and assuredly. And as the point that Owen mentioned before, that when employers know that this is what is coming um, uh, down the tracks, there is certainty about it. And it's not disproportionately impacting one sector uh, over over another. But I think over the medium term, um, there is nothing that constrains the UK uh, economy, in this case, Northern Ireland, from being able to have that uh, instance or that level uh, of, of, of taxation because we are uh, because we are we are comparing ourselves to the most competitive and productive uh, economies in Europe that are already at this uh, at this level. So um, I can't. I don't have a. You know, I'm. You know, economists so I think always uh, talk like they have a crystal ball. I don't. But I'm saying the balance of the of the evidence of similar uh, labour market um, interventions. Um, would uh, downplay um, the possibility of there being any significant uh, employment effects. Thanks, Paul. I'll probably I'd like to get in touch with you as well after this. Thank you. Okay. Please do. Matthew, sure. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Paul. And just worth it at the very end, there, there does seem to be a slight disconnect between what you're saying around the basically sort of fundamental dysfunctionality of our budget making process, which I completely agree with, um, and the fact that it in no way addresses severe structural long term challenges with our economy, particularly our chronic low skills, low productivity, low wage economy, but also you not really being that enthused about kind of fundamental reform of the way we do fiscal stuff. Um, now, it may be that what you're saying is you're skeptical about just narrowly talking about revenue raising, but if I was, if I'm reading you right, it's seemingly this: the way we do uh, budgets is completely dysfunctional, and we do not address our long-standing economic challenges. But we should sort of continue with. And I'm, I'm being unfair in the way I'm summarising you, but do you see what I mean? Like, it, it, there's a kind of chicken follows egg thing here. I think, you know, I, I get it that revenue raising is not a panacea, particularly in a dysfunctional political context. But at the same time. We kind of need something pretty fundamental, and surely isn't that what a fiscal commission and a fiscal council might do? Um, uh, whatever your, you know, whatever your, where, where, wherever you sit on the on the left, right constitutional spectrum, we need to do something pretty significant here. Yeah, I think I think to say to say on that, I I, I, I think there is a there is absolutely a possibility that in the future Northern Ireland could be uh, raising a substantial uh, amount of its of its revenue. My point is that there is a long road between where we are now and that, and actually that I think one of the one of the the areas that we that 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 we you know fiscal uh, fiscal or revenue raising measures kind of you know uh, come up all the time. But actually, the reform of the spending, the reform of the expenditure process should happen first. And I think that that's what the problem was in Scotland, that they, nobody looked at the expenditure side of it and decided then just to simply devolve a revenue raising ability into the into the mix. Um, and it's led to what I would describe as an even more convoluted uh, budgetary process um, itself. I also think there's a danger in talking about, you know, you know, one revenue measure in particular, and it was one that we, uh, we kept bringing it up during the corporation tax debate, whatever your opinions on that, the amount of volatility that it would have introduced into Northern Ireland's um, uh, uh, annual uh, uh, budget was never really, um, never fully uh, recognized. So I think that you start off by by reforming the way in which um, in which public expenditure is carried out in Northern Ireland first, and then you have a better idea of how you would maybe then introduce, begin to uh, introduce um, a certain amount of revenue volatility into the budgetary process. I think after you've achieved both of those things, then you can start to talk about devolving actual revenue raising um, powers. That it's a that's a process. There's a certain degree of maturity that's uh, that is that exists in other federal systems and uh, processes of fiscal equalisation. Australia and Germany um, uh, was a particularly good one. 
that that part of devolution of economic never, of devolution never came to the United uh, Kingdom. It's happening by stealth in in Scotland, and I I, I think it's a bit of a mess. And I think that um, that rather than just practicing the same thing in Northern Ireland, it should cause for a, a wider debate first about. Um, about uh, expenditure, then about how you introduce revenue volatility, and then how you introduce uh, ultimately fiscal uh, devolution. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I, I don't disagree with you on focusing on narrow taxes. That's, of course, one of our interventions is the one that costs us two and a half million quid per year for literally no reason. We have uh, we, we have devolved their passenger duty, which caught, which is a permanent cost on our uh, block grant for not just no economic benefit. Uh, presumably a net uh, loss. But anyway, um, uh, point taken. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Team, sir, Paul, thank you very much indeed for your evidence. And sorry that it's gone on, sorry, gone on so long. But again, thank you very much indeed. And when you're it's talking to Owen, just say... To the, uh, to the witnesses. Say again? Compliment to the witnesses. There. I wasn't making a compliment to the witnesses. That's what I'm saying. The fact that the evidence went on a bit longer. Than <laughs> <Yeah. you. laughs> I was complimenting them. You don't need any compliments. Yeah. Not me. Not me. Yeah. <laughs> not me. Sorry about that, sort of Paul. End joke and all the rest of it. But thanks very much indeed. Give her best to Owen and everybody else. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, Pat, you wanted some any other business? And it's in light of the of the announcement to the speculative announcements on the reviews from the Ulster Bank and Bank of Ireland and future operations in Northern Ireland, uh, the closure and how it's working out in this pandemic. I, was, I would like to propose to the Finance Committee as a member and chair of the Assembly APG that a group on, uh, of Fairbank and that we invite individually each of Northern Ireland main banks to meet with the Finance Committee to help the House understand better the future of banking in Northern Ireland and their commitment to the post COVID economic recovery, if that was possible, and the rest of you were in agreement with me. Um, Pat, it's actually the economy committees, um, sir, remit. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll tell you why. Because we've come into the committee and we're allowed to talk. They can go to the economy. But I believe that if, if we could find them well, it, it, it here ourselves, it's the commitment to this COVID uh, economic recovery. I mean, part of the finance and where we are in the finance is to bring forward ideas and try and push them in to that finance department in order to try and grow the economy we live on. So I, I, I think that it could sit here very well. There is a chance that uh, the head of the banks may not come in. They may well send UK finance, but it's still worth a shout to get them in to us. Uh, that's, that's a good proposal. Could you put together the proposal and contact uh, myself and the clerk, and we'll have a look at it, and then we'll circulate it out of committee so that you've got a view on it. Matthew, quickly. I think I would just add to Pat's proposal. I think it's worth us adding that, though it is correct that obviously the Economy Committee, because the Economy Department is lead in kind of economic recovery, Pat's right that there is a, 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 an interest for this committee. Specifically, you know, when it comes to, I think what's happened. Uh, by default is that the Northern Ireland Finance Department has ended up being a point of reference for financial services. Obviously, if you look at what's happened with the Treasury in London and, and the Department of Finance actually in Dublin, they both, you know, because they do financial services regulation and prudential regulation, none of which is devolved here, it tends to me to be that the Northern Ireland Finance Department often interacts. So I think there is a de facto, mm -hmm. and the, the clerk's looking askance at my suggestion, but um, uh, hear what he's saying to me under his breath. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I mean, and particularly because there are real issues around employment, uh, okay. I think. Uh, I think it points about it, but if Pat can put together a, a note and bring it to us, and we'll have a look at it, and we'll circulate it out of committee and the rest of it, because everybody, it's been a, a particularly long session today, but I think it has been a productive session. I apologise on behalf of whoever I have to apologise for for the IT uh, issues. And we'll look into that to see if we can fix those problems. I think it was a scam, actually, by the Department of Finance, so that we wouldn't be criticising their need for upgraded <laughs> IT, and that's particularly why they did it that way. But uh, next meeting, team, uh, 1400 uh, next uh, Wednesday, in here in the Senate Chamber and on Starleaf. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And that I shall adjourn, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber 
Program signed. This.